90. Right now, Congress is engaged in the process of attempting to reconcile existing tax laws and spending policy with the deficit reduction objectives outlined in the budget resolution passed earlier this year. The result of this effort will be a reconciliation bill that, due to the Democratic majority in the House and Senate, will mostly embody President Clinton's five-year deficit reduction plan. Witnesses included Congressional Budget Office Director Robert Reischauer, Representative Martin Sabo, Chairman of the House Budget Committee, and the Budget Committee Senior Republican Member, Congressman John Kasich. Good morning. The uh, Subcommittee on Legislation and National Security will come to order. Uh, this morning's hearing addresses the proposed extension of the Budget Enforcement Act in the reconciliation process. The President of the United States has proposed extending both the pay-as-you-go requirements and the discretionary spending cap of the Budget Enforcement Act. Yesterday, the President proposed the creation of a deficit reduction account <coughs> to hold funds from cuts in mandatory spending programs or revenue increases. The proposal follows through on an important commitment to the public. However, deficit reduction requires making tough choices, whether the savings are dedicated to special funds or not. The past 12 years, uh, administrations have run up three-quarters of the more than $4 trillion federal debt that exists. And now it's our job, the Congresses and the administration, to deal with this problem. Uh, some are also calling for spending caps to be placed on entitlement spending, correctly pointing out that the escalating growth of the deficit is a result of entitlement spending, particularly in health care programs. Apart from the political uh, controversy this may create, many feel that an arbitrary limit on entitlements could unfairly deprive Americans of needed benefits and remove an important counter-cyclical economic protection in difficult times. They caution that the answer to uncontrolled entitlement spending is to reform the entitlement programs, particularly the health care programs. I will uh, include the rest of my re remarks in my opening <coughs> statement in the record and turn to my distinguished ranking minority member, Mr. Al McCandless of California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and also I want to thank our witnesses this morning and tell Chairman Sabo, Mr. Reischauer, and Kasich how much we appreciate their presence. I'd also like to note the absence of the Office of Management and Budget Director, Leon Panetta. Mr. Panetta was scheduled to be our lead-off guest today. However, we learned about a half hour ago that he would not be appearing. Whether that means this administration is backing away from its support for extension of the 1990 budget enforcement agreement, or whether it means the administration is simply unwilling to openly discuss and defend its newly announced already criticized deficit reduction trust fund, I don't know. I do know, however, that Mr. Panetta's absence hampers the ability of this committee to do its job well, and that we must now proceed without administration guidance. I find it ironic and disappointing that the President has chosen a time when we are considering real deficit reduction to include in his proposal a so-called deficit reduction trust fund, just at a time when the American people had hoped to believe, hoped and believed that the administration cares about deficit reduction, we see a proposal that members of this administration called stale and rejected. Let me point out that now Deputy OMB Director for Budget Alice Rivlin called a similar proposal just a gimmick, quoted in this morning's Washington Post. Ms. Rivlin stated, I don't understand how earmarking a portion of the individual taxpayer's taxes for debt, for debt reduction can make a difference when we're running a deficit. As long as government is spending more than it's taking in, I don't see that has any real meaning. It's really just a gimmick, unquote. She was quoted as recently as a day before as saying nothing different is happening. 
Even House Budget Committee Chairman Martin Sabo was quoted as saying, I don't think it changes the substance of anything. When our president proposed this type of an idea, the Democratic candidate suggested that he did not deserve a second term. What does it say, uh, Mr. Chairman, about an administration less than 120 days into their term pulling out old rejected ideas to use as their own? I would like to hear from our witnesses about what has changed to make this proposal denounced as a gimmick when proposed by a Republican, a sound deficit reduction plan when proposed by a Democrat. Ross Paul, I believe, would simply say, this plan is goofy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I ask that the copy of this morning's uh, Washington Post article be included in the record. Without objection, so ordered. And the chair now turns to Henry Waxman. Okay. We'll go to uh, Mr. John Spratt, subcommittee chairman, government operations. I thank the gentleman for letting me participate in his subcommittee hearing today, but I, I don't have an opening statement. I look forward to questioning the witnesses, All right. particularly Mr. Casey. Um, <laughs> Let's see. Uh, you ready now? Ms. Collins, do you have a comment? Mr. Chairman, I have no opening statement. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, now, Mr. Waxman does have one. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I uh, wanted to defer to others on this committee to make their statements, but uh, I do have some comments that I want to make. I think the most telling point in this discussion of budget reforms is what you just said in your opening statement. One thing appears clear. The budget deficit is not caused by the budget process. And as a former director of the CBO said, the budget process is not the problem. The problem is the problem. If we're going to reduce the deficit, let's reduce the deficit. If that's our commitment, let's take the actions that will reduce uh, the deficit by two ways. Uh, decreased spending, or increase revenues or both. But to have these processes put into place, so often they're just gimmicks. I, I look at that Graham-Rudman uh, uh, process and I, we still have this enormous deficit. That was supposed to reduce the deficit to zero in a couple of years. Some of my colleagues think we ought to adopt the uh, amendment to the Constitution. And that amendment to the Constitution would prohibit uh, deficit spending. But then when it comes to voting to actually cut the deficit, they're not willing to do that. Caps on entitlement are a very dangerous idea because uh, it does not respond to the fact that our economy runs in cycles. If we put a cap on programs that are supposed to help people when they lose their jobs, it's at that very moment that those kind of entitlement programs need more money, not less. So I, I uh, am pleased to be here with you and to hear the witnesses who are going to talk to us about a process for reducing the deficit. I know this, that uh, you're going to have uh, Chairman Sabo from the Budget Committee. His committee reported a budget that was adopted this year, and we're in the process of fulfilling its terms through reconciliation, and will actually uh, start us down the road for deficit reduction. The way to reduce the deficit is to reduce the deficit, not to think that you're going to establish a process to do it and then not actually do the job. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. McCandless. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent that Congressman Klinger's statement be entered into the record. All right. The chair uh, invites uh, Chris Cox, a distinguished member of this committee, for any comments that he would choose to make. I thank the chairman and I'd like to welcome the ranking Republican on our budget committee with whom it's my privilege to serve John Kasich. I'm looking forward to his testimony. Uh, I am also uh, pleased to be here as the ranking member on the subcommittee of Commerce, Consumer and Monetary Affairs with our distinguished chairman John Spratt. Let me add to what uh, our ranking member Mr. McCandless has said concerning uh, the latest trial balloon concerning uh, this trust fund gimmick. Uh, it isn't really a trust fund in the way that Americans understand those words for two reasons. First, there is no reason for us to trust someone uh, who is adding $1.2 billion to the national debt in his own budget uh, to reduce the deficit. And second, there is no fund. Uh, these monies uh, will not be separately set aside, as 
Americans understand trust funds to be set aside, uh, any more than the Social Security Trust Fund is set aside or the Airport and Airways Trust Fund is set aside. They are simply accounting entries. The cash uh, goes out the door because the government is running an enormous deficit. Uh, the President, you will note, did not say that he was going to set aside monies to pay down the debt. Uh, only to, quote, reduce the deficit. Uh, and yet uh, the deficit uh, that he's reducing is his own estimate of an even bigger and worse uh, problem than we have at present. He said he's going to uh, reduce that all the way down to $200 billion uh, uh, and more in each of the five years of his budget. Uh, as a result, as I said, he's proposing $1.2 trillion of addition uh, to the national debt, and this trust fund gimmick doesn't change that in any way at all. Uh, I'd also like to uh, uh, differ with my colleague from California, Mr. Waxman, uh, concerning uh, the contribution that the budget process might make uh, to real deficit reduction and real debt reduction. I think the budget process does contribute to the problem that we have right now because it is so badly broken. Uh, the process is disorganized. The so-called limits in the process are easily avoided by Congress, and we're all aware that our Rules Committee in the House, for example, uh, routinely waives the Budget Act in its entirety. Over 50 percent of the rules in the last Congress passed out by our Rules Committee waived the Budget Act in its entirety. <coughs> Uh, there are no real enforcement mechanisms in the law. The 1974 Budget Act, which provides our con current timetable, uh, was broken in every respect, uh, with respect to every legal deadline uh, in 1992. So I think we do need to fix the budget process. And uh, Graham Rudman Hollings provides a perfect example of how process can help. Uh, our colleague from California said if it, if it worked, uh, gee, we'd have no deficit right now. Well, during those years when we had, had Graham Rudman, the deficit did go down. Uh, but uh, you may recall we repealed that Graham-Rudman law in 1990. Uh, I voted against the repeal, but several here voted for it. Well, of course it doesn't work any longer, and since 1990 we've had the largest deficits uh, on record. I think we do need to focus on the process. I'm delighted the chairman has scheduled these hearings for that purpose, and I'm looking very much forward to uh, uh, Mr. Kasich's testimony immediately following. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our first witness is the gentleman from Ohio who is a uh, affectionately regarded in the Government Operations Committee for his work on the B-2 stealth bomber, uh, his uh, energetic uh, and affirmative cuts in uh, some of the reckless defense spending, which it's not easy to do on, on that committee on which he serves with great distinction. Uh, he's worked on a number of, uh, of reforms in the health care area, and worked on uh, some foreign affairs matters. And uh, we welcome this distinguished and ranking member of the uh, House Budget Committee to begin our testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of like walking in the middle of a gunfight, to tell you the truth. Uh, the gentleman from California just made an interesting point, and he wanted to thank you for, um, uh, for scheduling these hearings. You see, the bizarre fact is he has to schedule these hearings and nobody really knows it, I would say the gentleman from California, because no one except for Marty Sabo, I would guess, because he does understand the 74 Budget Act. I don't, think, I don't think there are ten members of Congress that understand how the 1974 Budget Act works, why it was written the way it was written, and uh, what we do about it, whether we should do anything about it. and. Um, and this is the committee that has the jurisdiction. Now, you might say, why is it that the Government Operations Committee has jurisdiction over the Budget Act? Why is it that the Budget Committee doesn't have jurisdiction over the Budget Act? Well, and why is it that the Budget Act is con or the Budget Committee is constituted the way it is? Why is it that you have revolving terms and all these other things? Well, it's for one reason, because back in 1974, when the Congress of the United States had Richard Nixon in a, uh, I'd say, difficult situation. He was impounding, in addition to Watergate, we had this debate about impounding funds. And um, there was all this confusion about the way we were doing budgeting here. And believe it or not, in 1974, there was concern about entitlement spending. There wasn't any concern really about, um, so much about taxes. There wasn't great concern even about deficits, but there was concern about what was going to happen 
with what they called backdoor spending, which was entitlement spending. And there was no systematic process to try to coordinate the actions of everybody in the Congress. So in 1974, the appropriators got together with the authorizers and they decided that they needed to create this funnel or budget committee. But of course, as is typical among a bunch of lawmakers, nobody wanted to give any power to this uh, this conglomeration or this, uh, this new creation that we were going to make in 1974 called the Budget Committee. They wanted to give it some limited power, but what everybody was worried about is, oh my goodness, if we create a Budget Committee, we may actually create some kind of a super committee here that will take power away from appropriators and authorizers. So they established this Budget Committee and they said the Budget Committee will do this blueprint and then we'll go into this reconciliation process, which involves taxes and entitlements and discretionary spending on the other side, and never the two shall meet. And appropriators and authorizers cut a deal with one another so that authorizers would never mess with appropriators, and appropriators would never mess with authorizers. And uh, we would bundle an appropriation bill, and in case anybody was thinking about getting to be too powerful, we'll only let Sabo be there for six years and no longer than that. And this has had a a profound consequence to the way in which we do budgeting because there's nobody there who really cares about all this except perhaps the Government Operations Committee and the chairman here, who I'm sure understands the process, along with Mr. McCandless, are in a very select group of people who even understand what the 1974 Budget Act is all about. So you have to have these hearings because you have to talk about whether there needs to be uh, ex you know, changes in that fundamental law, whether you're going to do caps, whether you're going to do PAYGO. These are all very legitimate discussions to have in a committee that unfortunately doesn't really have any direct impact on what we do in budget. Now, if there's anything we ought to fix, we ought to say the budget committee ought to at least have joint jurisdiction. I'm not going to try to say we ought to take all the jurisdiction, Mr. Chairman, because I'm not going to get in a fight with you. But I think we ought to be playing a much larger role in terms of the, the writing of the Budget Act. Now, I'm going to come back to all that. What I want to talk about, though, is uh, the trust fund. I don't want to... Look, if I say anything about the trust fund, I might be flagged for piling on. I mean, you got Rivlin, Sabo, all the Republicans. Yesterday, the Washington Post asked me what I thought about it. I said, I'd like to read it before I comment on it, because maybe the President's coming up with something good. The only thing I would caution the White House about is when they come up and they say no more gimmicks and it presents something that isn't really going to control spending, it appears to me, and I haven't seen the details of this program, what I worry about is a credibility factor. You know, you get the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal starting to say, whoops, there goes the president again in terms of credibility. And I want to have a credible president, and I get concerned if the credibility becomes an issue, and I think right now it is an issue, and I wish they would either define this, make it real, put some teeth in it, or withdraw it, because it just, it's not going anywhere with anybody that I, I can, and I want to give credit to my chairman for, I'm not saying he's bashing the proposal, but saying, look, you know, it's not really going to achieve a lot, and that takes courage to say that, and I, and I respect that. Uh, in terms of the caps, obviously I think the caps on discretionary spending ought to be extended. But I think they ought to be kept separate. I, I don't see, see there's any reason. Well, let's go back to 1990. In 1990, we decided we were going to have this Budget Act of 1990, which did repeal Graham-Rudman, which was working. Um, and we put these caps in place. And the deal was we're going to have firewalls and we're going to have separate caps for discretionary and defense and foreign affairs. Now, why was the, and it was supposed to be that way for three, three years. Why did they do it that way? because they wanted to really protect defense from being raided. And what they decided was in the last two years of the Budget Act, it would be appropriate to raid defense, so we ought to eliminate the firewalls. And it was a deal. It was just a deal cut before between those that wanted to, wanted to cut the fence and those that thought we shouldn't cut the fence. I happen to think we ought to cut the fence, but I also don't think the fence ought to be a big pot that we raid and we ought not to put the fence in the free fall, particularly now when we talk about Bosnia and. Somalia and North Korea and all these other places. So I think the caps ought to be extended and I think they ought to be kept separate as we did for the first uh, several years of this, uh, three years of this Budget Act. And um, 
PAYGO is this business that Mr. Waxman gets concerned about. If you're going to create a new entitlement program, then um, you've got to pay for it. Now, this is interesting because I think, in a manner of speaking, it's worked. I am told that in Mr. Waxman's committee the other day, uh, Alec McMillan offered an uh, amendment to do a look back on Medicaid that saved about eight or nine hundred million dollars. And then Mr. Waxman, a couple days later, along with his, some of his Republican colleagues in a bipartisan effort, decided to establish a one-year entitlement program to pay emergency rooms in hospitals in Texas and New Mexico and California eight hundred million dollars uh, to fund illegal aliens going into the hospital. Now, he had to pay for it, and he paid for it out of the $800 million, so pay-go worked. If it wasn't for the $800 million that McMillan found, they could have just created this entitlement program and not worried about it. And I want to say to Mr. Waxman, I, have, I am one Republican that has a great amount of respect for him because he represents a point of view, and I've told Henry this in the gymnasium, he represents a point of view that ought to be represented up here. But we also want to be in a position as those who don't necessarily agree with all of Mr. Waxman's views to be able to say no. And PAYGO is one restraint on Mr. Waxman. Say, Henry, you want a program? Great. Pay for it. And I think PAYGO makes sense, Mr. Chairman. If we're going to create more programs in light of these terrible deficits, obviously we ought to have something that forces us to pay for it, and that's specifically what PAYGO does. Now, this whole business of emergencies have allowed us to get around the caps and discretionary spending. We declare emergency every day of the week, and I think we spent about $5 billion in excess of the caps because of declared, self-declared emergencies. We ought not to have all these emergency declarations. But overall, the caps have been, if you say anything, PAYGO has been an improvement, caps have been improvement in the system, we ought to extend them. And we ought not to just combine all the discretionary spending into one big pot. Now, let's talk about something that I am really worked up about and something that people really don't know about. This takes us back to the <coughs> Budget Act of 1974. You see, we're going through reconciliation. And let me explain this for the people who don't know it on the committee or for the folks that are out here. See, reconciliation means that the authorizing committees raise the tax money or affect the entitlement programs to achieve a certain deficit level. But you see, that's only one part of enacting the budget plan. The other part of it are the 13 appropriation bills. Now, let me come over here to this chart if I can. Because... Uh, process says, and we're in reconciliation. In fact, yesterday in the Armed Services Committee, we had a very interesting debate about whether we should pay active military people, give them a pay raise. I am one that advocates a pay raise for the active military people. I am not, Mr. Chairman, one that doesn't think we shouldn't reform some entitlements in the military. I have a provision in the Republican budget proposal which I offered before the Armed Services Committee, did not, that did not receive enthusiastic support that says that people under the age of 62 ought not to get a COLA with their retirement. And um, nobody's real excited about voting on that, but I think we got to have some fiscal discipline when it comes to all the committees. Uh, but I want, also want to give the military people a pay raise, the active military people. So I wanted to offer this but it wouldn't be, Mr. Chairman, deficit neutral if I didn't cut the fence more. Well, I don't choose to cut the fence more because the administration wants to cut the fence. Tell you the truth, we don't know because they have four different baselines. It may be as much as $150 billion. Would, the, I, uh, yeah. would, would my friend and the distinguished gentleman uh, work toward a conclusion? Yeah, but this, I, this is important, Mr. Chairman. This is a, uh, and you're going to understand this. I, I, I didn't mean to suggest it wasn't important. Now, you got other witnesses, I understand. Okay. Look, the bottom line is, I want to cut money out of other discretionary spending, and I want to use it to give the military their pay raise, and I want to cut defense 60 billion rather than 100 and whatever it is, 129, 30 billion. But would, I am would not my colleague, Would my colleague Act, do me a favor and take the mic because the 
a, a lot of people aren't getting the benefit of this. Yeah. Well, Mr. Chairman, what the chart illustrates is under the Budget Act, I am not permitted, I am not permitted to cut discretionary spending in order to offset tax increases. I am interested in presenting to the Congress an option between tax increases and increased spending. What I want to do, and my Republican colleagues have wanted to do, is to say, we don't want to have tax increases. And we're prepared to lay our specifics on the table, and we are prepared to avoid tax increases. But, Mr. Chairman, the 1974 Budget Act does not permit me to cut discretionary spending and use it to offset tax increases. The only way I can offset tax increases under the 1974 Budget Act and the rules of the House is to increase the cuts in entitlements. Now, I've got $60 billion more in entitlement cuts than what the Democrats have in their package. But I want to take that $60 billion and apply discretionary cuts to offset tax increases. I am not permitted to do that under the, under the 74 Budget Act. And the reason is, is that there is a Berlin Wall that goes between the categories. You see, reconciliation means that all we do is raise taxes and cut entitlements. But I can't reach across into the discretionary spending accounts and bring money over because the Berlin Wall prevents me from doing it. So essentially what I'm telling you, Mr. Reischauer will tell you, that if I was to write up my plan, he would score it as he scored my original plan at savings of $429 billion. He will score my substitute to the Democrats' reconciliation package at the level that I believe it should be scored at. But he will also tell me that I am technically in violation of the law and out of order. So the American people will be prevented from having an opportunity to see the Congress vote on discretionary cuts, cutting appropriation bills, and using those cuts to offset tax increases. A technical reason, a technical provision in the law will be a short shrift for the American taxpayer. And I think First of all, I'm going to introduce legislation to knock the wall down. But you, Mr. Chairman, ought to reach forward and you ought to change this business. You ought to say that if the Republicans want to have the guts, as Mr. Waxman said, to cut the deficit, not the gimmicks. You've got a gimmick that keeps me from cutting the, de the deficit. Get rid of the gimmicks. Let me reach across. Let me put my cuts on the table. Let me put my proposals on the table and say I want to eliminate tax increases. And that change in the 1974 Budget Act would be a significant improvement in what we do. And let me tell you, Mr. Chairman, in conclusion, this is nothing but a, but a power game between the committees, between the authorizers and the appropriators. The appropriators don't like the authorizers messing with them, and the authorizers don't like the appropriators messing with them. And let me tell you, the more that Ross Perot hears about authorizers and appropriators having an having an ego spat, preventing us from having a, a uh, with, without eliminating the technical violations to cutting spending first, he'll be on TV again talking about the failure of Congress. And I think you ought to give us the ability to put our cuts and control the deficit and not have these gimmicks that Mr. Waxman talks about prevent me from doing my job to cut spending first and eliminate the tax increases. So. I'm glad to be here. I think you ought to do the PAYGO. I think you ought to do the CAPS. And I think you ought to take this 1974 Budget Act. And I think you ought to, you probably ought to throw it out the window and start again. And um, that concludes my testimony. Thank you very much. Sorry to have all the charts, Mr. Chairman, but. Well, there were only three. Thank you very I much, didn't show you. Mr. Kasich. I didn't show you the three. Uh, let, me, uh, let me thank you for starting us off. Uh, and let me also further invite you to uh, share. We're going to study your statement and your extemporaneous comments and see where they come together and what that boils down in terms of particular uh, directions to this committee, which is why we're holding the hearing. And so uh, I'll be looking forward to working with you on this matter, and I appreciate the enthusiasm and the sincerity which you convey your points. You know, you're a reformer, Mr. Chairman, and uh, you get in people's bailiwicks all the time. I can remember more than one 
conver muffled conversation in the Armed Services Committee room about, do you know what that Conyers is doing on the B-1 today? Um, you're a reformer, so you ought to look at this seriously. You ought to give us a chance to play ball. You ought to give us a chance to, to run the ball. Well, sir, we have worked together before, and I don't think it was the last time. Good. May I recognize now Mr. McCandless? John, you and I came to Congress in the 98th Congress. I mention that because during the 98th Congress, we waived the budget rules 133 times. And since then, we have waived it uh, a number of uh, years in excess of 50 times during the budget year. What kind of an impact would that have if we had not waived the budget to the degree that we have over the years that you and I have been here? Well, we've raised it, Mr. McCandless, over 500 times. Well, I mean, what would, the, uh, what would it be? It would be we'd have lower spending and lower deficits. I mean, we, again, we use a gimmick to waive the Budget Act. I mean, was it, maybe it's a gimmick to put it there, but it's a gimmick that allows us to waive it. I mean, it's just a, it's like uh, walking to vote every day. We do it as a matter of course. And uh, we shouldn't have these waivers in the Budget Act. And let me tell you one other thing. These baselines are the dumbest thing in the world. And the Democrats, now I know Henry Waxman won't agree with me, but the Democrats ought to endorse getting rid of baselines. Because if they want to cut the deficit, then they ought to be for getting rid of the baseline and have what we have in South Carolina and Ohio. If you don't get a raise, it isn't a cut. If you have a freeze, it's a freeze. If you cut below this year, that's a cut. We ought not to say that a slower increase in spending is a cut. And we ought to get rid of baselines. It would help everybody do their job easier so people could understand what the heck we're doing. And we should stop all these silly waivers. It's I mean, 500 waivers. That means there is no, there is no role. I mean, if the rule is you don't walk across the street because you're jaywalking, but the cop never gives you a ticket and everybody jaywalks, then there's no rule, effectively. So let's not be silly around here. So the, the 1974 Budget Act that you uh, went into detail is really a piece of Swiss cheese when it comes to what we've actually done in terms of, uh, of waiving the Budget Act. The 1974 Budget Act was a deal between appropriators and authorizers to try to deal with the problem of entitlement spending, but they didn't want to let anybody get into anybody else's jurisdiction. That's all it was, and a power grab by the Congress to take authority from the President of the United States. And since that time, Mr. McCandless, we have been using all of our efforts to try to restore one little bit of power to the executive, and that's called the line item veto. So we shifted all the power away when the President was weakened in 74, and we did a pretty bad job of constructing how this system ought to work. And let me tell you, go on the floor and ask anybody, well, you know what the, what the uh, uh, Government Operations Committee was doing with the budget today? I'll guarantee you, you can't go over there now and find five members that can tell you what the heck's going on in this room today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. More than welcome. Gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kasich, you seem to be complaining about these barriers that keep you from proposing changes in the budget that you think are appropriate to meet the needs of the country. Is that, is that um, correct? Now, if that is the case, then why don't we just have a budget each year and we'll establish how we're going to raise the money and how we're going to spend it. We'll establish our priorities and then we'll have to live by that budget. Doesn't that make a lot of sense? It sounds to me like you're getting under the hood and fixing it. Okay. What you seem to resent is the fact that you can't make a change here uh, and affect something over there. Well, do you, if you believe that we ought to be able to establish a budget, do you also believe we ought to have artificial caps on entitlement spending? Well, let me, let me, let me say to the, to the gentleman that if you want to work with me to design a system where we don't have this, look, you know what Dole said after we passed the budget? That doesn't mean anything. Now we start shooting real bullets. Remember he said that? That's because nobody, when they vote for the budget resolution, takes it seriously. Well, I took it seriously. Well, you do, now, because let me just you say, understand it. We took it seriously in our committee. We made deep cuts in Medicare and Medicaid. That's in our committee's jurisdiction. I didn't like making those cuts. I know that. Because when we made those cuts, we had to cut back on providers and what they got paid. We had to cut back on services for people who are covered by Medicare and Medicaid, and those are the elderly and the poor. Now, if you have an entitlement cap on two health care programs, uh, you're going to have some uh, artificial results 
by those caps. Because why are these programs increasing in spending? The reason they're increasing is because health care costs are going up so rapidly. We have more people who are poor as a result of the recession, so they get on the Medicaid program. We have a growing elderly population. We have new technologies in medical care. And when we put a cap on the entitlements, what do you think will be the result of it? Well, let me, let me say to you, uh, Mr. Waxman, uh, you know, you're not under a charge to have to do it the way the Budget Committee tells you. All we do is a broad outline. You can, our budget resolution can be fixed any way it wants to. You can say that we're not going to, uh, we, I mean, we don't even get specific. We had a debate in the Budget Committee about whether we ought to be specific. If you tell me that you are in favor of a system that would get all the Congress to know that when we enact this, this is what we're doing to Medicare and Medicaid, we get specific. We lay it out, then we give it to you, and you do it. I'll help write the bill with you. I'll co-sponsor well, it. In terms of the caps, let, let me, me just, respond directly. Let me just say that if we set uh, what we want to do in spending on discretionary programs each year, if we say we want to achieve a certain amount of savings in these entitlement programs each year, then the committees will have to work th their will and maybe rearrange it, but come up with that result. But if we put in a cap that says we must achieve a certain amount of spending and no more in these entitlement programs, the only way to get the savings uh, to comply with an entitlement cap is to cut eligibility, shift even more costs to the beneficiaries or the private sector. Because, you know, if we don't pay for health care for uh, a lot of these people in the public yep. programs, then those in the private yep. uh, programs are going to pay for it. We slash provider payments. We eliminate benefits. We deny the poor and the elderly access to the same technologies yep. available to you and right. me. That's why, no, excuse option. me, excuse me, that's system. why, that's why I don't want somebody coming in here yeah. telling us we must have a cap on entitlement programs. Give us a blueprint each year in the budget resolution as to what we must do. Now, you made a to-do about Alex McMillan's proposal. What he proposed was the Clinton administration's recommendations for cuts in the Medicaid program. We took that, we achieved more reductions in Medicaid. We saw one area where the administration asked us to see if we can come up with some funding to help emergency rooms that are heavily burdened by large numbers of undocumented aliens, which they must, by law, uh, treat, at least stabilize, and pay for under the Medicaid program. And our uh, states that are troubled with that uh, charge are saying they can't deal with all these uh, immigrants that are brought into the country because the federal government hasn't policed the borders sufficiently. So uh, this was a reasonable proposal, but we knew we had to pay for it. Are you acted in as, no, you acted as if in a patronizing good. way that I didn't know, oh. as a senior member of Congress, that if we spend, we got to raise the money to do it. That's an obvious thing. You either raise the money through taxes or you cut back on spending. Well, we did that because that's what the blueprint of the Budget Act required of us. Let's do a Budget Act each year, stick by it. But don't put these artificial caps on entitlements. I don't know about these artificial Berlin walls, yeah. as you call it. Maybe we shouldn't have those either. Okay. But I just think uh, that uh, these gimmicks cannot replace the will to enact a budget resolution and then see it through. Well, let me, let me say, let me respond, Mr. Chairman, because I, I, I want to say to you, first of all, Mr. Waxman, I'm not... I am no, in no way, shape, or form trying to take a shot at you because of what you did. What I'm telling you is, is that you quickly gobbled up $800 million that was saved. And can I just That's finish? correct, but we met the budget targets right. so we and we saved said, an additional amount. I said under the current mechanism, pay-go makes sense because it even restrains Henry Waxman. That's what I said. Well, if you don't but think me, that's taking me, a I, shot at me, what do you think is taking a shot at me? Henry, you It believe wasn't Henry Waxman. It was an administration proposal to meet a real important societal need. You'll put a cap on Social Security. A young man like you will not have to worry about not getting a cost of living increase, but a lot of elderly in this country are not going to make do Henry, if they don't get those Social Security Henry, increases. Henry, what I said was, you have a passionate commitment to a lot of different things. There's other people out here don't, that don't share all of your passionate commitments. What PAYGO does, as I said earlier, is, is it gives the other side an ability to say, wait a minute, if you're going to create a new program, pay for it. Now, let me go I on. I don't dispute that for a minute. You talk about the problems, and you listed a whole list of, pro of problems that drive up costs. Number one, you're not, we have to fix the system. That was not one of your 
one of your proposals there. You said slash providers, do all this. Let me give you another one. Stop mandating on the states. Let the states have the flexibility to do Medicaid the way they want to. I think you object to that all the time. I mean, the states have been interested well, look, in having flexibility, I, 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 and you've Mr. been Chairman, mandating the states. Mr. So Mr. stop Chairman, mandating the states. My time, I don't know why this has become a debate as to what I believe and what I don't believe, and you want to characterize it. The fact of the matter is that the health care costs for both Medicare and Medicaid are going up because the health care costs in our whole health care sector right. are going up so rapidly. And Medicaid cost increases are due to that fact and more people uh, added to the roles of, of uninsured and poverty cases so they get on Medicaid. That's what's driving the cost up. Now, if you want to throw some cliche about mandating something on somebody no. uh, on the, at Let's the state level, the fact of the matter is you may not care passionately about low-income women and children being covered for basic needs when, they're, when we're trying to give the next generation a start. I do believe in it, passionately. You may not want us to mandate that nursing homes in these states have decent quality care. I believe in it, passionately. And so does the Congress. And we enacted legislation to tell the states that they had to meet certain basic standards. Mm -hmm. Would you disagree with no, it? No. I, I, I think I believe more passionately in that than you do. I think the difficulty comes down to the fact, Henry, that when we have a program like that, number one, is that we ought to pay for it. And you know, number two, my governor, George Voinovich, believes passionately, and he'd like to have some elimination of mandates that you impose. But let me just tell you about the caps and the concept behind it. Look, I, I have been saying for five years we need to fix health care. You believe we need to fix health care as well. But we keep moving along. The one concept and the one legitimate argument on the concept of caps is it forces us to start to make hard choices so that we can continue to provide Somebody Quality will tell care. you that you can't make those choices you were complaining you couldn't make because of artificial lines. If and you want to make those choices, make them and get the uh, Congress to agree with you within the context of a budget that we would adopt. If, if we, we want to do some changes, we've got to pay for it in the entitlement area. But to put artificial caps on entitlements, especially in the health area, is going to lead to terrible results and they're artificially imposed upon us. They're not going to be thought through. And I think that it's not consistent with a budget act that lets us do what's necessary it, it, to meet it, the needs of again, the Again, Mr. Waxman, I say that we've got the two-pronged process here. We've got, we've got this thing called reconciliation now, and then we go for the rest of the year doing 13 appropriation bills. We pass this broad outline, then we go, and we don't do everything together. People are voting on the resolution. They never seem to understand that the resolution actually translates into some action in the committees. And I'm saying that a more simplified process, I mean, the one you suggest, I would think that would be great because the current system is so complicated and confusing. And if I don't want to cut entitlements more than what I proposed, and you've seen the proposals that we've made in our budget, which are designed to guard people in our society that don't have anything, uh, I don't want to cut entitlements at this point deeper than what the recommendations are that I made. That's why I want to reach across. But a cap can you, can you hear me it. out? You put a cap on the growth of Social Security, which means you cannot increase Social Security. I didn't put Security. any cap on you, that. I didn't, I, but let, me, let me talk. That's an entitlement. But I didn't put a cap on that. No, no. Do you, are you proposing that we do it? I didn't put a cap in my budget. McMillan has a bill. Are you bill. proposing to this committee that we put caps on entitlement programs for the future? I, would, I think that, it, that what we should do with the caps, and I have a recommendation is in here on entitlement programs, is the administration, Marty Sabo, me, you, and a bunch of people sit down in a room and try to work out something that has to do with uh, some kind of a reasonable cap. I have avoided saying year specifically, I want, to talk, I want to work with you on it, but I also want to say that since entitlements are exploding, you and I got to work together to try to control them. And, uh, you know, PAYGO is one element of it. I think PAYGO makes sense, and I don't think you object to that. But if we got go, to go to a cap system, I'm willing to work with you on the cap system. I would like to say that you and I ought to write a new budget act, because the per current budget system is silly. If I don't want to cut entitlements any more than what I propose, and I want to go in here and go across and reform something else in the discretionary accounts, that's how I want to reduce the deficit. But I can't do it under the current law. So if you are feeling strongly about preserving these entitlements, which I know you do, then you've got to help me to be able to include discretionary spending in the mix. That's my point.
The chair recognizes Mr. Cox for a few questions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd be delighted to uh, uh, make a few comments and, and put a question to Mr. Kasich. It's my understanding that uh, Congresswoman Collins, uh, for scheduling reasons, needed to uh, uh, proceed next in order, and I'd be delighted to yield for that purpose if she wishes to do so. I would like to uh, thank, I thank the gentleman very much for yielding, and I certainly appreciate his consideration of my time. Uh, I, I did want to make a comment or two, and that is this. First of all, I find that I am highly, I feel f offended that the gentleman would come before the Government Operations Committee and make a statement that he feels that the members sitting on this committee don't know what the heck is going on in this Congress and don't know anything about this budget process. That is highly offensive. Secondly, uh, the gentleman mentioned something about an ego spat. And I think what he has done here today is a typical example of exactly that, that the gentleman has fed his ego to the cameras, to those who are listening throughout this nation, to those who are sitting in this room, and I think that should never be done by another member of Congress before any committee, regardless of what he thinks to himself, but to make that kind of indictment of a congressional committee, I think, is beneath the gentleman's dignity, or should be beneath his dignity. Finally, let me say this. If the gentleman is dissatisfied with the way the budget process works, he has a right to explain what his problems are with it. However, to say that he wants to do a power grab, if you will, and say the budget committee ought to be empowered to do more than a committee should be, then work with the chairman of the committee and work with the, the, the speaker of the house with the majority leader and other people, but to have a screeching indictment of a congressional committee that has sat here for years and years, that no, some of us helped to write the budget law before the gentleman ever got here, and to, be that kind of, to, to issue that kind of conduct, I think, is just beneath your dignity, and I'm surprised at you. Well, Mrs. Collins, let me, let me just say that I'm not trying to indict somebody by saying that the budget, that the budget law in this Congress is not you clearly... You indicted members of this Congress when you said that you doubted if 10 members of the four, out of 435 knew anything about this budget process. No, I didn't and say I knew anything. And I would dare to differ with you. Well, Mrs. Collins, let me say that the Budget Act and reconciliation and all these different appropriation bills, the outline, what the Berlin Wall is between them, in my opinion, is not well understood. Why? Well, I'm glad now you say in your opinion, because before then okay. you made a flat-out statement. Well, and look, that I'm glad you said in my opinion, because now you have corrected the issue well, greatly. Mrs. I said that I believe if you went over to, I, I don't want to get in a debate about it. I'm just well, trying to say to you. I know you don't, because I think you erred, and I think you made a mistake in so doing, and I yield... I give the gentleman back his time. And well, thank Mr. The Chairman, I'd like to uh, be able to respond to that. The, pro the problem is, is that the 1974 Budget Act is arcane. It is confusing and it is not well understood. We sat in the Armed Services Committee yesterday and debated what the rules were. At one point, we had to use, uh, we had to use the staff to try to explain what can be done, what can't be done, what should be offset, what shouldn't be. That isn't a this is a complicated, detailed, arcane system that well, needs to be simplified. Well, do you think that members don't have the ability to no, understand not, what a no, detailed, arcane system is not all about, no. especially if they help to write it? See, that's the conclusion you drew. I said that the system is so complicated and confusing that we just simply don't know it because it's so arcane. That, of course, doesn't mean, look, in the course of somebody in Congress doing their job, you're doing, a, you're doing a thousand things in one day. Oh, we all the last thing that. that members are going to do is sit down and try to understand the intricacies of the 1974 Budget Act. So that I'll be happy to yield. Explain to us the difference between PAYGO and a cabinet entitlement. Well, a PAYGO, Mr. Waxman, means that if you're going to create a new entitlement, you've got to pay for it. You have to come up with the taxes to pay for it. In terms of the cap, the cap you know, provides an overall, it, prov it would provide an overall uh, spending limit. And under the cap proposal, uh, I think you could reduce other spending. Isn't the cap, a cap is not what you put in a budget each year. A cap is what you put in if your projections may be wrong for growth in the future. Isn't that right? Repeat that again. Cap and entitlement would be your your judgment as to what the growth is going to be in the future, and you're going to say, even if yeah, your you judgment was wrong, you're not going to let it grow any more what, than depends that. Depends what kind of a cap you're talking about. You can say you can't exceed the cap. 
under pay go you could exceed the cap but you pay for it i mean there's just a difference in terms of whether you don't permit spending to go above a certain level well there's a, and if i might just mr chairman i think one of the problems is that this gentleman is arguing to us about budget reform does not understand that distinction which is a very basic one when it comes to entitlements pay go means when you spend more money in an entitlement area you have to make up for it that's right you either raise money for it by additional revenues or cuts in other programs a cap on entitlement means that you make You're a projection a for the future right. as to what the growth will be. And if your projection is wrong, for example, right. because there's a dip in the economy and more people are added to the rules, or you uh, underestimated the inflationary impact in the health care sector, then you have a cap that says you have to then make cuts in that program uh, in order to stay within that cap. And that's very but, different than PAYGO, and it seems to me that there's been a confusion as the gentleman's you, talked about it. PAYGO is something that said. nobody here disagrees with. Caps in the future on entitlements is right. something that many of us disagree with because you lock yourself in to a judgment in the future that can do a lot of harm in the real world to real people. And that's why I said, Mr. Waxman, that I support PAYGO, but that when we talk about caps, as I say in my testimony, I want to sit down with, I want the leadership, I want the White House, and I want the Republicans to sit down and try to figure out what we do in the area of caps. So you don't want I mean, us to put artificial the, caps in that, well, without us considering it year by year? I think it is... Is that right? No, no, let, me, let me answer it. I think it is reasonable for us to put some kind of caps in place. I am willing to say, I mean, I'm going to try to help Alec McMillan with his concept. But I'm also willing to tell you that if you have improvements on what you think those caps ought to be, if, and you know what caps represent and is the fact that, in, look, we're four and a half trillion dollars in debt and entitlements are exploding. The question is, how do we deal with them? And I think that one of the legitimate ways to deal with them is this concept that Alec McMillan pushes called caps. Now, Am I willing to say well, that I think... Maybe we ought to have Alec McMillan here to explain no, what he I'm, means by well, it. Well, his caps mean you get the you know, inflation and demographics. That's the cap. Well, inflation and, and demographics could be very wrong as to what, in fact, will go I on... I don't disagree with ...in the real that. world with those programs. But I think I'm, the gentlelady from Yielding, and it is her time, but I did want to point that out. And so if, if you say you want to work with us, we, each year we should figure out what a cap ought to be or what, what the spending ought to be, what reductions we ought to make, that's different than an artificial cap that says no matter what... We're going to be forced to reduce those programs, no matter what harm it does. Mr. Chairman, Mr. California, Mr. Chairman I would like to thank the gentleman from California again for, for yielding to me and yield back the balance of my time. The chair, the chair well, continues chairman. to recognize Mr. Cox. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think we caught uh, Congressman uh, Kasich in mid-sentence. I yield to you for you know, the balance I, I'm of your hold answer. I'm firm on my feeling about the fact that people do not. Uh, in the Congress understand the complexities of this act. You know, it's interesting, Mr. Chairman, when I tell people about this Berlin Wall concept here, do you know that people are um, really surprised about this, don't know about it, unaware of it? Now, that doesn't mean that uh, they haven't done their job. It means they're unaware of it. It means that this is such a complicated, confusing process and procedure that um, it needs to be fixed. And if the gentle lady from Texas is upset about that. I'm sorry she's upset, but I think it's true. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Kasich. And to uh, proceed with, with my own time and questions, uh, just very briefly, uh, uh, I don't think if we go back and take a look at the transcript of what's been said here this morning, there will be much question about uh, uh, what uh, Congressman Kasich has has said this morning, it's something that I think most members on various occasions have said and agreed with, our existing budget process is broken down. Uh, it doesn't work. If it worked, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in. Uh, it is so convoluted uh, that, uh, of course, people don't understand it because uh, the law is violated. Even if one has read the 74 Budget Act and committed it to memory, uh, it might not do you good in any particular year because uh, Congress operates outside the Budget Act. When we went out to Andrews Air Force Base, for example, uh, to conduct the 1990 Budget Summit, uh, that was a totally extra legal process. It was improvised that year. Uh, and likewise last year. Every single 
date, every single deadline in the 74 Budget Act was violated by the Congress. So Congress makes it up as it goes along, and every year is a little different. One year we'll send uh, a CR down to the President, it'll be the whole thing slapdash put together, and the President will sign it or shut down the government. Another year it'll be the reconciliation bill, uh, and another year it'll be something else again. What we need is a budget process that really works. I think the gentleman uh, uh, has been overly modest. Uh, in talking about uh, his own expertise and, and accomplishments in the area of budget process reform. Uh, the Republican Budget Committee, under his leadership, put together a, a paper called Cutting Spending First. Uh, there is an appendix uh, to Cutting Spending First that deals uh, with budget process reform, and it recommends legislation, uh, real legislation already drafted that's gathered over 150 co-sponsors, including Democrats like Charlie Stenholm and Tim Penny, uh, that would do precisely uh, what the gentleman recommends with respect to, for example, PAYGO. It would permit us to use PAYGO across the board, not just cabined off for entitlements. It would permit us to uh, uh, cut spending with result anywhere in the budget. I think it's a very, very important uh, provision. Uh, likewise, it provides real budget enforcement, an end to budget waivers, which we've discussed here this morning. It provides for a legally binding budget in the form of a law, not a non-binding concurrent resolution, which is currently the case. No more blank checks for uh, uh, any spending programs. No more of the such sums as may be necessary appropriating. Uh, it's a very a thoroughgoing proposal, and it deserves the attention of every member uh, of this committee. I hope that uh, uh, we will go back and read Cutting Spending First and its uh, uh, substantial detail on budget process reform. Uh, and I just want to congratulate John Kasich once again for, for doing all of that. Uh, and I wonder uh, uh, if you might permit me also to comment that uh, while so-called artificial caps on any spending of any kind uh, uh, may well have real-world consequences that uh, affect real people. So too does unrestrained government spending. Uh, if we have uncontrolled spending, the real-world consequence is that uh, senior citizens who live on fixed incomes become victimized by inflation. Uh, we have interest on the debt now accounting for roughly the entirety of our deficit, so we have no money to spend on programs such as uh, my colleague from California would like. It is in all of our interests, if we are compassionate people, uh, to get rid of that damn deficit. Uh, and that means controlling spending, not leaving it uh, to run amok uh, because we're afraid of so-called artificial caps. Limits on spending don't occur in nature. Men and women have to make them. They're artificial in that sense, but they're vitally necessary, and I think they are uh, important for compassionate people. Yes. Well, I mean, the, the whole deal is we're four and a half trillion in the hole, and under the president's proposal, we're going to go up another, tri uh, you know, another trillion dollars in debt, and we cannot just keep going in debt. I mean, everybody, you know, the everybody in the, that observes the Congress and, and observes the uh, the state of the government says we're racing towards bankruptcy, and we let these things go unrestrained, and I think that the concept of saying that the Congress better sit down and get some fundamental things fixed, agreed upon, face up the tough decisions, take on special interests, is exactly uh, what I think this concept of restraint brings in. And that includes caps. Now, I don't know, I say the gentleman from California, precisely how the cap ought to work when it comes to entitlements. I do intend to support the efforts of Mr. McMillan to try to force some decision making. I think it, it makes sense. Uh, Dick Darman advanced that concept, as you will recall, to the Budget Committee before, uh, before he left as Budget Director. Uh, but it isn't going to be easy. And what we don't want to do is have an artificial cap and say, if we don't meet the cap, we just throw people off the program. That's the downside of it. The upside of it is maybe we can begin <coughs> to do some things that addresses the fundamental problems that are driving the deficit. And um, look, I'd rather not have all these silly things that we have to do, the waivers, the caps, the, uh, the pay going. I, I'd rather just make it a simple deal. I'd rather make it a simple process. Uh, Senator Mack and I are working on a proposal right now that would, um, again, it works with kind of within the confines of what we have with the playing field that involves uh, something like a new Graham Rudman. Uh, but the whole process would be, that's, that's why I encourage the chairman. I'm glad you're having the hearings. Maybe this will be the start of a series of hearings where we can figure out how to simplify this whole thing and begin to deal with our deficits. Because I tell you, uh, people back home aren't happy with where we're going and they want fundamental changes.
Thank you very much. The chair recognizes uh, subcommittee chairman Spratt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kasich, let me sort of review the bidding with you. You agree, I take it, that the discretionary spending limits in the Budget Enforcement Act of 1990 have had a beneficial effect. Yes. And you agree that the PAYGO rule has worked beneficially. It has yes. helped us. They're not perfect, but they've been it's in the, the right process. direction. So these two rules, while they are complicated and could be perfected, have nevertheless had a, a beneficial effect on budget discipline and deficit reduction. Yeah, I mean, there were, there's a, a whole host of other things that I would say, Mr. Spratt, we ought to do, but... Um, Your problem yesterday in Armed Services Committee was that you were trying to increase direct spending for military pay, provide a pay raise, and basically all we have to pay for it in the rest of our budget is discretionary spending. Well, see, the, the pay business is not direct spending. It's a hybrid. This is another yeah. thing that... I would argue people don't really know that much about. Pay does, is not an entitlement. It's really in the discretionary counts, but for whatever reason it was, pay gets put into this hybrid that's really discretionary but gets reconciled, gets included in reconciliation. There's about $40 billion, I think it's $43 billion, in this hybrid type of spending that we deal with. So what I was trying let's, to do Let's yesterday. leave that aside because it's really a diversion. I mean, it's just one of those complex problems. We can still work it out. Well, but what I was trying to do yesterday, Mr. Spratt, was to say that I want to pay for the military pay raise, but I want to pay for it out of another discretionary account, out of out an of appropriation 050, bill. Not out of 050. You want to go into some other... Uh, exactly. Yeah, because I understand I think, that. Exactly. And I am prohibited from coming to the Rules Committee and presenting a proposal that would specifically say what I would cut in order to make up for the pay raise that we give because of this Berlin Wall, because we don't get to the appropriation right. bills till later. So when appropriation bills comes, the only thing I can do you is had your shot. It. You aren't really prohibited from doing it. It's just that the opportunity for doing it has passed. We had that debate. You had it in the committee. We adopted the resolution on the floor. Now we say that you can't backslip. You can't backpedal. And We've it, decided what the allocation of but you know, is. The incredible thing is we passed the budget resolution. Members went home. And now the uh, members are in the Ways and Means Committee. There are a lot of them are under fire trying to figure out what to do. And they are, their flexibility to trying to reduce the deficit is limited by the 74 Budget Act. I don't think there would be anything wrong with somebody saying, well, you know what, I think we cut too much out of the military and I think we can make some savings in another area now that we've had a chance to look at it and we ought to be able to reach over here and fix something else and bring it back to, to, uh, to fix the military. That, that's really a different problem from what we're talking about right now. Maybe that's a problem that can be addressed in looking at the budget process, but today we're talking about do we extend PAYGO, and I suppose you support that, yes. extending it from 95 to 98. And do we extend the discretionary spending caps, and you support that? Correct. Then the other question is, is there a way that we can budget entitlements? Because the missing piece in the whole puzzle is some sort of process for disciplining in the out years what we intend to budget for entitlements. Well, that was the debate. What's your proposal? Let me just ask you, could you lay out for us how you would budget or cap or limit or discipline entitlements in, in the fiscal years between now and I mean, one of, the, one of the ways you could do it, Mr. Spratt, is you would say that, um, for example, uh, if Medicare is growing by 12 or 14 percent, next year we want it to grow by 9 percent. The year after that, we want it to grow by 7%, and the year after that, we want it to grow by 4%. Well, I don't know if that's the exact number we ought to do, but that's the concept that I have. And what it does is it forces you to make decisions, but recognizes you can't go from 14% to 4% in one leap, because if you try to do that, then you are really creating a, you're really you, creating you, a big disruption. Would you propose then to have this ascending cap on individual programs or on entitlements in the aggregate generally? Well, I would, I would probably think we'd need to do it, uh, you know, take for example health. We probably ought to do it, you know, in the health area for one and, and maybe in the other area. But I'm kind of off the cuff now. What I think the real answer is, is that we got to get the people who are most intimately involved. We ought to have the budget committee. 
we ought to have uh, energy uh, and commerce. We're just trying to find out what your we're idea is. We're trying to work it out. We, but we ought to put some restraint on there that forces us. So, suppose we did this. Suppose we took the PAYGO rule. And we ex right now the PAYGO rule applies to intended increases in right. benefits and intended decreases in tax, tax cuts, tax expenditures that diminish tax revenues. Suppose we extended the PAYGO rules to unintended increases in benefits. That is, benefits that we had not projected above a certain baseline for 94, 95, 96, 97, 98. To the extent that uh, entitlements individually in certain programs or in the aggregate exceeded what we had intended, then we had a mandatory reconciliation process with a PAYGO rule applicable, meaning that we would either pay for it with added revenues or pay for it with diminished benefits. I think it's an interesting idea. Could you sanction you the idea of added revenues to go along with uh, the idea of... Let me tell you another interesting fact, and I, I did not have it in my testimony today because I just learned it yesterday. In, inflation, I am told, and, uh, and just inflation is accounting for about 40 percent of the entitlement increases. It, I mean, that's that's, I mean, in the area of health. And that's amazing because it says that even if you want to cap it with inflation and demographics, you may, you may begin to deal with 60% of the problem, but 40% 40, 40 of the problem is being driven by a very high uh, medical inflation rate. And so it, it complicates your problem even more. It begins to force you, you know, what it really does is it begins to force you at some real fixes of the fundamental system. Look, the five-year budget projection and the budget resolution we adopted for entitlements provided for entitlements to grow in terms of budget authority from a trillion five in 94 to a trillion 259 in 98. About 26% growth. Could you agree to codify that? sort of provide that that baseline would be the baseline we would work from? I, I, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I can't tell you. I don't want to, I'd have to go over it, Mr. Spratt. I'd have to, uh, okay. to look at that proposal. But you see, these are, the, these are the kind of things that I think we have to think about when we start going, if we go beyond PAYGO and we do caps, and like I say, I'm for this concept of moving that down the road, but I don't think we ought to lock ourselves in stone in terms of how we do it. I think we've got to look at innovative and imaginative ideas, and I think PAYGO is one, uh, one element that can be helpful, but I think there are, there are others that we have to be careful and examine and put into place. Thank you, sir. Uh, the chair is pleased to recognize the uh, ranking member of the full committee, minority, Mr. Bill Klinger. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Casey, thank you. I just want to commend you as being a very effective, uh, articulate advocate for Republican principles in, in budget making and, and commend you on the, uh, the very, very credible effort that uh, was made this year by you and the members, the Republican members of the Budget Committee and offering an alternative which uh, I think made a lot of sense uh, to a lot of us uh, and uh, did not rely as we are now having to do on um, massive tax increases to accomplish the same goal. So I think you deserve a lot of credit for that effort. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't here to hear your, uh, your statement, um, and maybe you've already addressed this question, but uh, we now have a proposal for a trust fund uh, as a means of uh, isolating or building firewalls, if you will, around uh, the use of uh, tax revenues. Uh, at first blush, we've only had this now on the table for a day, but at first blush, uh, uh, have you got reached any uh, preliminary conclusions as to whether this makes sense? Well, part of the problem is, is that if you say you're going to take cuts and taxes and put them over here on this side of the ledger, but you're not going to do anything about the spend, and you're going to say all of this is going to be used to reduce deficits while at the same time you're driving the engines of deficits then you're just, I mean, it, it doesn't solve anything. It doesn't fix anything. And it's, um, I, it doesn't have any teeth. So all you're doing is, is separating, you're separating, separating out your funds. And I don't think that that's effective. And it gets back to, um, you're going to cut the deficit, you've got to cut the deficit. And, you know, at this point, 
Let me say this to you. I think the American people are far more willing to accept tax increases and use tax increases to reduce the deficit than they are to have tax increases for additional spending. Uh, I just don't know, but I don't think this proposal does that. When you have, uh, I don't know, $182 billion in, a, in new spending in the Clinton budget, as I recall, uh, and then you put the taxes over here and say, we're going to pay for the deficit, but you don't control the spending, what the heck have you done? And what you may further do, I'm afraid of, is you further create credibility problems in the minds of a public that is already believing that, um, th that's already sour on this institution. I mean, they already don't trust us. And so I think that this, uh, this trust fund business either ought to be worked with some teeth in it. Now, Mr. Walker has a proposal that creates a checkoff that does have, a, have teeth in it. That if you check off money to pay down the national debt, then we are forced to reduce uh, spending on the uh, operating side. That has some real teeth in it. And maybe they ought to talk to Bob Walker about his mm. ideas. I think that has some appeal to people. I think a lot of people out there like to start paying down the national debt, but you can't pay down the national debt while you're building up the operating deficit. So what Walker's bill would do would be to say anything that you, any revenue that you would normally send to operate the government, if you put it in the deficit reduction or in the retiring the national debt, you've got to offset it in your operating budget. That's got teeth. And maybe they ought to talk to Bob Walker and a, uh, well, I'll tell you, a President Clinton-Bob Walker uh, uh, a duo would be more surprising than Dellums Kasich. <laughs> <laughs> I thank the gentleman. I just have one other question, All right. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, just uh, to get your views, I don't know that I, I know your feelings about this, but a lot of us have talked about a, a capital budget approach over the years uh, on the grounds that under, under the present system, we don't really know how much we're borrowing f just to run the day-to-day -day operation of the government and how much we're borrowing for, uh, to create roads and, and uh, so forth, and more investment-type uh, activities that are represented by the capital side of the budget. Uh, and it also, I think, has merit as a, as a planning device to see where, what our real needs out there. Do you have any views on, on capital budget as a... As a I, ha I, I think that it's a slippery slope when you get into this question of investment, because one person's investment is another person's pork. pork. And, uh, you know, I just think we've got to be, you got to be careful about this concept of investment. I thought that the Highway Trust Fund was designed to kind of emphasize these capital improvements, but um, one of the other problems that we have is that you know, we have a triangle now in the government where budget people and analysts and policy people don't like to talk to one another because they may get a bad conversation. And what, why do I bring that up? Because I think that I think the system is broken. And I think that uh, reform of the 74 Budget Act, the, the kind of ideas you're talking about with the uh, capital budgeting, what John Spratt is talking about in terms of some kind of enhanced uh, some kind of a cap system or restraint system on entitlements. What, what does all this mean? This all means Mr. Cox's uh, reform uh, uh, proposal that has received a lot of support. It shows that people are not happy with the status quo. And we ought to sit down and do and make a commitment that we are going to overhaul this system. And I can't think of anybody who's better, that would be better at overhauling this, who would be willing to take on the varied interests than John Conyers. He'd be willing to tell people, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to do this. And I think that maybe we ought to push for it. Maybe we ought to set up hearings and deadlines and, and recognize that no one's very happy with this and we ought to do it uh, as a Congress. Thank you, Mr. Casey. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you very much. You've, you've uh, consumed a great deal of time, but you've said a lot of things that we needed to hear. And uh, like Mr. Spratt, we're in the process of sorting this out in terms of some specific direction. And uh, this committee is going to weigh in and uh, try to come to as much agreement as possible. You know, this isn't going to be accomplished in a vacuum, not by me alone nor by yourself alone. It's going to take uh, a number of other people 
working with whatever plans we all put forward, and it's in that spirit that I'm glad that you've started off the testimony, Mr. Kasich. Well, Mr. Conyers, in the, you know, one of the, the things that I've always felt was important is that you come to closure on a lot of different issues, and I think we have a tendency, as any group of people trying to make a decision, have difficulty coming to closure because they don't know where they want to, where they want to end. And maybe if we can, can, we can be convinced that there needs to be some fundamental changes, we'll get them done. But we've got to make up our mind that we need some, and we're going to get there come hell or high water, and, and I'd like to work with you to do that. Thank you very much. Thank sir. you. Chair is pleased to call the Chairman of the House Committee on the Budget, the uh, uh, ranking, uh, the subcommittee chairman on uh, banking, former Speaker of the House in Minnesota, and uh, one who has been uh, quoted and misquoted uh, at great length uh, throughout these uh, budget proceedings. Marty, uh, uh, Marty Sabo, we're delighted to have you here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. A pleasure to be here. I must admit that as I looked up at uh, your name tags there, I was uh, shocked to look up and see the name Sabo and uh, see it on the minority side of the uh, <laughs> rostrum up there. And Kevin, uh, good to see you, uh, even if you're on the right, wrong side of the aisle. I'm just curious. Uh, my background's Norwegian. Is that the, yours the same or not? No, it's Hungarian. Oh, okay. <laughs> Probably dropped a Z. Okay. I was wondering all of a sudden if I had a relative up there. Look, we believe a Sabo is related no matter what country they come okay. from. Okay. But thank you. Let me make just a few comments and then open the floor to whatever questions uh, you have. L let, let me put it in, uh, where we are today in context of what we're dealing with in uh, 1993. And, uh, I just have to say that fundamentally the problems we face in, in facing uh, dealing with budget priorities and uh, dealing with deficit, dealing with economic policy and economic growth in this country is not fundamentally a problem caused by process. It's a fundamental cr problem created over the years by leak, uh, lack of agreement on substance. And all the change in process in the world is not going to make up for uh, lack of agreement on, on substance or the willingness to do substance. Fact is, uh, this year we have before us uh, uh, a very comprehensive economic uh, program by President Clinton. One of the components of the, that program is the largest deficit reduction program over a five-year period that's ever been proposed to Congress. Uh, we are move in the process of moving that program through the Congress. The first step was to pass a budget resolution, which sets the broad guidelines uh, for the policy that we're going to follow. That is a meaningful act, and it has real, uh, real numbers in it, real instructions to committees on what they have to do in the reconciliation process, uh, real numbers to appropriations for caps on discretionary spending. Uh, those caps have gone to the Appropriations Committee. We are now going through the reconciliation process where individual committees are making their decisions how to achieve the deficit reduction uh, envisioned in the budget resolution. And that's an appropriate process. I, I would not begin to suggest to you that those of us who serve on the Budget Committee have all the wisdom that is dispersed into the various committees of the Congress. And uh, the committees have discretion how they meet those numbers, but we expect them to meet them. And all the reports I'm getting from various committees uh, are that they are on track to meet the deficit reduction targets assumed in the budget resolution, maybe in a fashion different than the President recommended, maybe in a, a fashion different than assumed by those of us on the Budget Committee, but they're getting there. Those numbers are going to be achieved. Uh, the question you really have before you is how do we make sure that those judgments that we're making in the budget resolution and the reconciliation bill are not simply things that apply for this year but also apply into the future. Two, two key ingredients of the 1990 uh, Budget Act clearly need to be extended. 
Uh, one is extending the discretionary spending caps, which currently go on through 1995, through 1998 to, to represent the five-year scope of, uh, of this bill. Uh, clearly, that should be done. Uh, the second issue is what you do with PAYGO. And PAYGO clearly has worked, uh, which says that if you make policy changes in the future, you either have to have additional revenues or make correspond corresponding cuts in other uh, programs to pay for them. And frankly, they worked very well and, and need to be extended. The other thing we have to do is rebase PAYGO so that when we finish this process this year, uh, the credits to committees who are doing PAYGO is back to zero. Because theoretically, as uh, PAYCO operates, uh, as you make cuts in entitlements or increase revenues, it gives a committee specific uh, authority to use those credits in the future. Some committees have credit uh, banked from previous years. Uh, we will make significant savings and reconciliation this year. And clearly, when we finish that process, we have to make sure we rebase PAYCO at zero so that all of those savings are not available for additional expenditures in the future. Those are the key ingredients where I think there's broad-based agreement and, and clearly should be done. Uh, the question has come up of entitlement caps. I would urge the committee to examine them, but to ex examine them with caution. Uh, and they're proposed for a variety of reasons. I suppose one you have to go back to is what happened in 1990. The 1990 budget agreement had the discretionary caps, had the pay-go provisions. Still, the deficit today is substantially higher than what was projected in 1990. The fact is uh, that uh, those higher deficits today are not related to the enforcement mechanisms we put into that act in 1990. The discretionary caps did work. Pay-go did work of all the variations uh, from 1990 to 1993, has nothing to do with these budget waivers people talk about. Uh, the policy changes accounted for only about $2 billion of the difference. The budget waivers are basically technical, procedural things that has no significant impact on discretionary sp spending or reconciliation spending. That's just a side issue that deals with the mechanics of operating the House. Where you do have real problems is that several things happened after 1990. Uh, the economy changed. We lost money in, in revenue simply because the economy did not grow as, as fast as expected. Uh, uh, secondly, there were estimating errors made as one projected the cost of programs forward. Uh, these are called technical errors emanating out of then uh, uh, it happened in both uh, OMB and, and CBO. Other changes, in some cases court decisions uh, changed eligibility uh, uh, programs, not legislative or executive action. All of these things in a fashion added up to in substantially increase the deficit what, from what has been projected. As one looks at a variety of entitlement programs, uh, some are not going to vary much. The, 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 the number of beneficiary, beneficiaries are fairly clearly understood. Benefits go up by inflation. They are not likely to vary much from what's projected. You have others that operate fundamentally in a counter-secular fashion, and I think you would want to be very careful before you put any caps on them. Uh, those programs are there both to benefit an individual, but they are also there for economic benefit. Uh, to make sure you, you, you lessen a downturn in the economy. Uh, and, the, and then there are others where costs control, uh, costs escalate faster than what we had assumed. And frankly, the big ones are health care. And, uh, and uh, you need to look at that issue, uh, but proceed with caution. I think what concerns some people uh, is that as we project our deficit projects, projections for the future, they are skeptical about the projections we made for future costs of, of health care programs and, and want to cap at those levels, not at some artificial level below current policy. Look at it, ask questions, uh, but be cautious and be careful would be my suggestion to the committee. And uh, as you do that, uh, we will 
want to continue to work with you. There are a whole series of technical amendments that one has to make in bringing uh, uh, the Enforcement Act of 1990 up to be uh, uh, to, to fit uh, 1993, and we're anxious to work with you on that. But when it comes to the core, extend uh, the discretionary spending caps uh, through 98. Uh, extend PAYGO and rebase it at zero when we get through with the policy decisions of this year. I'd be happy to respond to any questions. Well, thank you. Uh, Chairman Sabo, you and I have worked closely together. Our committees have, too. Uh, my predecessor on this uh, committee, the Chairman uh, Brooks, has worked very closely with your predecessors in budget, and I see no reason for that to change, and we thank you for your testimony. I thank you, and we are anxious to continue that cooperation. Chair recognizes Mr. McCandless. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Sable, we got involved in a rather intensive discussion relative to the budget process. Uh, having spent 12 years very heavily involved in budgets at another level of government, uh, when I came to Congress 11 years ago, I was aghast at how the budget is handled not by the persons involved, but the system. And I came to the conclusion very early that the budget system, as it's now practiced, is uh, not successful in the past, it isn't successful in the present, and won't be successful in the future. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but uh, I'd be interested in any comments that you might have relative to the process. The process doesn't bother me fundamentally. Uh uh, our problem's not been processed. Uh, frankly, uh, uh, we've had some very fundamental changes in our economy that I don't know that we've ever adjusted to policy-wise, starting with the oil revolution of the early 70s. We had problems that grew in our economy. In my judgment, the Congress made some very fundamental wrong decisions in 1981 that took an economy and a budget with some real problems and made, escalated the, the problems that had emerged from the 70s. And uh, we had an absolute explosion uh, of, of deficit spending in the 80s. That was not caused by a process. It was caused by policy decisions uh, made by the President and Congress. And uh, all the process change in the world isn't going to change the dynamics of doing policy change to de try and develop an economic policy that brings us to the 21st century and that brings also the deficit under control. My judgment, uh, we have by far the most comprehensive program uh, uh, that I've seen in my 14 years here to deal with both fu fundamental economic policy and to deal with deficit policy before the Congress today, represented by President Clinton's program. Question is, can we pass it? We're moving in that direction. We haven't made final votes. If, uh, if we vote, they can ultimately pass it. I think we make a very fundamental step forward because we come to agreement on substance, not because of process. Process here, I suppose, uh, you know, do I think it's perfect the way it works around here? You know, it could be different. I, I spent lots of time in the legislature before I it came here. I served six years as speaker. Uh, uh, I spent uh, a significant part of my time as speaker of a state legislature probably doing what I'm doing now as chair of the budget committee because we didn't have a budget committee making sure that pieces got coordinated and fit together. And I suppose if one person's doing it, it's neater. Uh, that's not likely to be the process that's ever going to occur around here. But the basic uh, relationship between the budget, the committee appropriations, authorizing uh, committees, not all that complicated. Uh, we set the guidelines and budget resolutions. Uh, uh, we expect it to be implemented by individual committees that have more expert knowledge. Uh, but uh, when you get to the core of it, you, you have to have eventually some agreement between the President and Congress on fundamental fiscal and economic policy. And we had that division didn't achieve it in the 80s. Hopefully we can achieve it in 1993. I think it's incredibly important that we do. I think you could throw in the 1980 tax, 86 tax bill, and along with the other things you mentioned, that has created some of our problems, but that's a personal opinion. Uh, what I was trying to do is not solve the deficit by changing the system. That wasn't my intent. The problem I have here is that everyone assumes that what is going on at the current time within the 
the agency, the department, or the bureau is as efficient as it can be. And therefore, uh, because of inflation or because of something else, uh, we have established that this particular agency is entitled to another 7% uh, in terms of its budgetary process over and above what it got last year. But we're satisfied with last year, even though we didn't examine the ingredients that made up last year's budget. And that is an element here within the framework of the federal government that I take a, a serious exception to. I, I frankly have to disagree. I don't think that's what happens. Uh, the, the appropriations to various agencies do vary. That is not in any fashion automatic. They go up and down. If you come to the basic question, can we do a better job of administering the federal government? I, th I think the, abs the answer to that is an absolute strong yes. I think one of the most important things uh, that uh, President Clinton can do is uh, the Gore Commission and c Committee that is looking at streamlining the federal government. I frankly would have to say I find, I think there are not many well-run federal agencies after the last 12 years. Well, and I don't know that we uh, can restrict it. They have not kept uh, up with modern administration. Uh, and I, and uh, I think those need careful review both how we run government, how we regulate through government. I think that is a core issue for the Clinton administration to deal with. Uh, that goes beyond their, it clearly has long-term implication on their budget policy and on their budgets. Uh, uh, they reflect some of that in their budget for this year, but I think they have to spend an incredible amount of time simply on the management of the federal government uh, uh, in the next couple of years. And it's not a jazzy issue to deal with, but I think fundamentally very, very important. I don't want to sound partisan, but I think you could add to that 12 years, another 12 or 15 years, and not miss too much when it comes to the management process of the federal government. Could be. And uh, it's I, not, it clearly not, my sense is that uh, yeah, a good number of state and local governments terms of how you handle new information, how you process data, information, all of that is ahead of the federal government in most cases today. Yeah. Well, if there is an interest in addressing the issue of the budgetary process, Mr. Chairman, I would love to be involved because that, that would be something that uh, I feel I could contribute to. Thank you. Thank you. We'd be delighted to uh, keep you in the loop, Mr. McCandless. Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Sabo. I very much appreciated your presentation. What you're recommending to this committee in terms of uh, any changes in the budget process is that uh, we continue the existing rules with regard to PAYGO and, and, uh, and other recommendations that we've seen from the Clinton administration. Is that correct? I think you, got, you, you have to extend the caps through 88. I think you have to extend PAYGO, and I think you have to rebase PAYGO when we through, get through with the process this year so that there are not accumulated credits and that the savings of, uh, of reconciliation both on spending cuts and tax increases are in fact there for reducing future deficits. S some of our colleagues are recommending that we put caps on entitlements, uh, uh, caps that would say if entitlements increased be beyond uh, what people expected through projections that there would have to be automatic reductions in those entitlement programs. Do you favor that approach? Not at this point, but I would suggest to the committee that I think you should listen very carefully to those folks. There are a variety of people proposing caps. There are some uh, suggesting them as sort of an artificial way of driving policy. I, clearly, I think clearly those are not going to be adopted. There are others who are legitimately concerned that the projections we are projecting for future years may not be, right, be accurate and say they want some protection against that. I don't know how you quickly remedy that fear. I think based on history, they have some legitimacy to the fear. I and, understand. And so we need to talk. I do not think it serves a purpose to dismiss people out of hand. I think it needs to be talked through, thought through, and see if there is some way to deal with that problem. Clearly, there are certain programs that are kind of secular. Uh, I think caps there could, could be very counterproductive, uh, aside from their impact on individuals in terms of their economic impact. 
But there are other places where, it, and healthcare is clearly the biggest area. We're, we've not been very good at projecting, projecting future costs that go beyond changes even in the economy. But isn't that why the Clinton administration has taken on this whole issue of health care reform? Because they have concluded that simply reducing the federal expenditures, which are the Medicare program and maybe Medicaid, although Medicaid may be excluded as a countercyclical program, but those two health care programs financed by the federal government, if we simply artificially reduce the expenditures in those areas, we will shift the costs onto the private sector insurance uh, uh, insured population or uh, into uh, the, uh, the whole sector for those who are otherwise getting care and, pass and shift those costs on to others, but not deal with the overall cost inflation in health care itself. So therefore, President Clinton has indicated that one of the major things he wants us to do after this budget reconciliation is address that question of health care as a system so we can control costs. I, I think that's an accurate description of what the president's describing. I, I would, would, uh, I would I say would, that you're I, right in not dismissing anybody has concerns about entitlements or about the deficit. Yeah. We all have to be concerned about that uh, deficit and what it's doing to our country. But I, I would hope that those who are looking for an answer out of frustration with the increases costs and entitlements don't dismiss the fact that, that what uh, might result from some kind of arbitrary caps that would force uh, reductions in these programs is that, is that we're going to do a lot of people harm. For example, uh, the, the two big areas of increases are Social Security and the health uh, programs. All the other entitlement programs have been cut. And I would think that uh, some of those same ones that will be cut, have been cut in the past, will be cut in the future unless we're going to go against Social Security. I don't hear those people saying they really want to go against Social Security. If the Medicare program is the issue, seems to be health care reform is the answer. I would partially agree and partially disagree, I guess, in my own judgment. I do that not as someone who serves on those committees. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it is clear that uh, the costs of Medicare and Medicaid are driven substantially uh, by what happens in the system in general. And I hope that the dealing with overall health care reform deals with those cost increases. On the other hand, I have always also had problems somehow with the assertion that we cannot do anything about the cost of delivery of Medicare or Medicaid unless there is overall reform. I, I, I don't uh, think me, that's accurate either. Yeah, but I, but I, I hope you're not saying that uh, unless we have caps on future growth in these programs that we can't do anything to try to make the system more efficient. No, I'm not saying that. After all, you that, know what we've done just this year to produce an enormous amount of cuts in federal dollars going into that program. We're constantly looking for ways to make Medicare and Medicaid more efficient systems uh, while at the same time we wait for, um, we wait for um, the health care reform initiative to deal with the problem overall. I, I fundamentally agree with that, but I do have people who do suggest to me that we can't do anything with those systems unless uh, the big reform is there. And I, I hope that by the year's end we pass this big reform. Uh, I spend some time in one of my other roles, in, I've spent in, in defense subcommittee, uh, spending some time on uh, a health care reform in, in DOD. And we think some of the things we've done there is lessen costs. And uh, we've got to make sure that state and local governments, particularly on Medicaid, are moving aggressively. In my state, I think they are. And uh, there's lots we don't know in that area. But your uh, state will still be affected. Yes. If yes. we come no, in with a proposal that, that says we're going to do something up with all the entitlements and put a cap on it, and then we're going to have to choose between programs like Social Security and uh, food stamps and Medicare and Medicaid and all these others. Now, there's a, just a basic inequity in all of this because the programs that are clearly going to lose out are the programs that affect exclusively or primarily the poor. They don't have the powerful constituency behind them. That's one reason that there'll be an inequitable result. The other is that uh, we're not putting in an automatic increase in taxes in, in any way uh, because the deficit isn't going down the way we'd like. But we're putting automatic caps on entitlements. And I, th I fear that all that also works against the people who have to rely on those government entitlement programs 
for very basic necessities of life to live on and get health care, pay their rent, and get some food for their children. Mr. Archman, I find myself sort of in a position, I'm listening to people, and I am trying to define a position some people are taking which does not necessarily reflect mine, because I think it is important you hear them out. And I've been trying to do that. And, and I have my own biases that probably are not much unlike yours. But I've also discovered in this process that it's important that one try and listen out to those concerns. And I never assume I'm totally correct with my biases. Well, so I think that, that's I, always wise I, advice. I, I am suggesting it. that... Let's, let's recommend it to everybody involved. I, you know, that there are certain suggestions for caps that I fairly would react to, to uh, react negatively very quickly. Uh, there are others that I think are before this body today because of very legitimate concerns over his, from viewing um, the problem of entitlement growth from history. And we better look at them carefully, is what I'm suggesting to the committee. But I'm also suggesting if you decide decide to proceed, do it cautiously, because it can have lots of, uh, lots of ramifications. So I have no particular recommendations to you on it. What I'm saying is, though, is that there are people with very legitimate concerns, and I think you need to hear them out and see where we, if any place, we can find agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Spratt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Slavo, thank you for your testimony. Let, let me ask you, the budget resolution that we adopted in accordance with the budget procedure carries out the projections for all programs over five years. Uh, are you reasonably comfortable with the five-year projection for entitlement programs? At this point, I am. Uh, if I could predict the future for the next five years with absolute certainty, I expect I could not leave this place to, and make a fortune. I'm not trying to. You know, let me put it this way. We keep monitoring uh, with budget committee staff. You know, we want some judgment independent from OMB and CBO. Our judgment is that the economy s seems to be on track with where CBO thought it was going were in the basic economic assumptions that the administration is using. Uh, those were fairly cautious economic assumptions. The economy, despite its problems, still appears to be on that track. Uh, interest rates, uh, which drive expenditures, appear at this point to below be below what the administration was projecting in their budget. At this point, for the near future, we would think that interest costs would probably be less than what was projected in our budget resolution. The, the number I have, and it may or may not be right because I haven't checked it, is a trillion five billion for budget authority for entitlement programs in FY94, rising to a trillion two hundred and fifty nine billion in FY98, which is about a twenty six percent increase. And that accommodates Social Security demographic growth, the growth of the beneficiary population. It accommodates the annual COLA for Social Security. It accommodates a $7 billion increase in food stamps. Certain entitlement programs will be expanded. And as I understand it, it accommodates pretty substantial growth, which we have to expect and plan for in Medicaid and Medicare, except for about $45 billion that... Uh, Mr. Waxman and, and Mr. Stark have uh, taken out in the reconciliation process. It still has to be finally settled, but still it still allows for pretty substantial growth in both of those programs. Suppose we somehow codified that out-year projection, the entitlements rising from a trillion five to a billion to a trillion two fifty nine, and simply provided, not simply, and provided that we would have to reconcile to that. Uh, out-year projection each year over the next four or five fiscal years. If we didn't hit it or come within a certain range of it, say 10 percent, then there would have to be some reconciliation and we could extend the PAYGO rule as I proposed to Mr. Kasich so that you would either have to, you'd have to confront the issue. Do you want to cut benefits further or increase the revenues to pay for it? In any event, you've got to make the, uh, you've got to make the 
you, you've got to reconcile it so that uh, you don't uh, contribute further to the deficit. Uh, do you think that's workable? Could we pull out, say, unemployment insurance, the things that are clearly countercyclical, and, and simply leave them out of the equation? And let, let me make one caveat on the numbers. My understanding is inflation may be somewhat higher than what was projected. Okay, which you could that take would the have variables an and, and just adjust the number according yeah. to the variables. Yeah. I, I think I would respond to you the same way I've, I responded to Mr. Waxman. I would. I would categorize what you're talking about as a serious proposal that needs careful exploration involving folks like Mr. Waxman, uh, I think involving Ways and Means Committee that also has jurisdiction over a significant amount of these yeah. programs. That examination might, you know, my bias would be not to do it. But I don't think it's a proposal that should be dismissed out of hand and should not be visited with between folks like yourself, Mr. Waxman, Mr. Rostenkowski. Uh, and uh, because it, I think it, it, it comes about because of what happened in 1990, I don't think that's necessarily going to repeat itself. Uh, so, so I would hope uh, folks who represent that point of view would seriously visit uh, uh, with people like Mr. Waxman and uh, Mr. Rostenkowski, who frankly have much more detailed knowledge on the difficulties of doing it and the specifics of the program that I pretend to have. And, uh, and that's where I think that dialogue has I, to I, occur. I take it what you're saying, and, and I feel the same hesitation in proposing the idea, is that Henry has good reason to be yeah. wary of this proposal, and he's seen what happens when we cram lids on spending programs and we shift costs from the public sector to the private sector. We don't really deal with the issue. On the other hand, I, I, I think by virtue of the fact you're saying it's a serious idea, it has to be thought through, you recognize that uh, the biggest missing piece in the whole budget process is some means of budgeting entitlements. Yeah. And clearly that does happen through reconciliation, as Henry said so very effectively earlier. We have significant reconciliation cuts that are part of the reconciliation process this year. Uh, they are not fun for anybody. Uh, Henry's committee has <laughs> heavy lifting to do, and they're doing it. That many cases would prefer not to. And I think we have to recognize that fact. And, uh, and I think there's sensitivity to be caught in sort of... Uh, arbitrary situations for the future that's beyond control after they make good judgments uh, uh, that clearly concerns folks. Uh, part of the problem of what happened from 90 to, to, to 95 are court decisions. Uh, th those are decisions that weren't made by energy and commerce, ways and means in terms of eligibility for s certain programs. They have significant impact on the outlays from those programs. Uh, but. Uh, what I would encourage people to do is not get locked into absolute advocacy or opposition position and do some visiting with each other. Well, thank you. I very think much. that's what's needed. Thank you, Mr. Spratt. Uh, Chairman Sabo, we appreciate your coming before us. Uh, when the opportunity presents itself, uh, take a look at H.R. 1200, the American Health Security Act, okay. and see how that might weigh in on uh, reducing some of the uh, rising costs in our health care system. Uh, your conversations with us has been very enlightening and quite important. I thank the chairman and the committee. The uh, director of the Congressional Budget Office will take the witness stand as soon as we return from this recorded vote. We're delighted to uh, have Dr. Robert Reischauer again before the committee, director of the Congressional Budget Office, whose prepared statement will be incorporated into the record and invited to proceed in his own way. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> I appreciate this opportunity to uh, appear before you and discuss some of the budget enforcement changes that could be included in the upcoming reconciliation legislation. Uh, I will submit my prepared statement for the record, and what I thought I would do this afternoon is spend a few minutes summarizing four of the lessons that I think we've learned about enforcement from our experience over the last seven years 
and then point uh, to what they suggest uh, for the work that uh, lies ahead of you. As you know, we've tried two very, very different uh, approaches to forcing the deficit down, uh, the first being uh, the Graham Rudman Hollings approach and the second being the Budget Enforcement Act approach. And uh, we have, I believe, uh, some lessons from uh, this experience. The first of these, uh, I would uh, argue, is that budget procedures are much better at enforcing deficit reduction agreements, uh, such as the Budget Enforcement Act has done, than at forcing such agreements uh, and forcing the President uh, and the Congress to reach them in the future. Uh, the Graham Rudman Hollings uh, experience proved, I think, quite convincingly that procedures alone can't force the President and the Congress to come together on uh, difficult measures that they don't want to uh, undertake. Second lesson is that enforcement procedures work best if participants are only held accountable for results that are under their direct control. Under the Graham Rudman Hollings regime of fixed deficit targets, economic and technical factors which were beyond the control of the policymaker uh, were partially to blame for the deficits exceeding the targets. Uh, and uh, this caused, I think, a lot of uh, heartache and, uh, and uh, problem. Uh, moreover, it was impossible under that system to identify which budget participants were responsible when the deficit did run amok. Uh, there wasn't any clear location of blame. I think uh, the Budget Enforcement Act uh, regime uh, offers a stark contrast to this. Uh, it had separate enforcement procedures for discretionary spending and mandatory spending in revenues, and it had automatic adjustments for changes in economic and technical factors, and therefore uh, was a more responsible uh, way of enforcing discipline. Third uh, lesson uh, that uh, the past uh, has taught us is that to be viable, the enforcement process must be credible. Graham Rudman Hollings lacked credibility because it promised results that were virtually impossible to achieve and because the enforcement mechanism that it relied on had all the subtlety of an atomic bomb. And so many uh, of the participants were uh, skeptical that uh, the trigger would actually be pulled on this uh, enforcement mechanism. Fourth and finally, the enforcement process cannot be too rigid. Uh, that's a lesson that we've learned. It must include a certain amount of flexibility or wiggle room, I think, uh, to allow reasonable responses to unexpected events such as natural disasters, international crises, uh, or a sharp deterioration in the economy. And this is precisely what the emergency uh, segments of the Budget Enforcement Act have allowed uh, the Congress to do. And on the whole, I think the uh, extent to which Congress has uh, uh, gone into the emergency pot uh, has been uh, very modest given the uh, circumstances that have faced the nation, given the, uh, the uh, uh, economic weakness and the other uh, crises that we have faced. Any enforcement legislation included as part of the 1993 Reconciliation Bill should build on these four lessons. This suggests that the enforcement bill that you craft should extend the discretionary spending caps, uh, should extend the PAYGO process, and should also extend the various temporary provisions of the Congressional Budget Act, such as multi-year spending allocations and enforcement, which are necessary to weave the whole uh, thing together. Uh, furthermore, fixed annual ma maximums for the deficit should be dropped, uh, especially if these maximums are going to be adjusted to reflect changes in economic or technical factors. In a sense, they're superfluous if uh, we have uh, the system that we've been operating under for the last uh, three years. Beyond this general framework, there are a number of design issues for which our recent experience offers no clear guidance. Uh, the first of these is the question of whether there should be a single cap on all discretionary spending or separate caps for different spending categories as there were during the 1991 to 1993 period. In other words, should we maintain that system of a separate cap for defense, international, and domestic discretionary uh, spending? Multiple caps can be used to protect some category of spending from further reductions. 
They also can ensure that any further reduction in a given category's uh, uh, spending will wind up as deficit reduction rather than as increases in spending in some other area. On the other hand, a single cap provides flexibility, which I think is important in an era of rapid change, a good deal of uncertainty, uh, and uh, an era when we think that our priorities might shift rather quickly. And so you have to weigh these, uh, these uh, arguments. The second issue is whether we should maintain the system of caps on both budget authority and outlays. If budget authority is capped, outlay caps are somewhat redundant because over time outlays merely represent the liquidation of budget authority and therefore are constrained by the, bu by the availability of that budget authority. Moreover, the system of dual caps has fostered a certain amount of distortion over the last three years, and here I would refer to such things as the obligation delays that were uh, provided over, the, over some of uh, the appropriation bills to delay the spend out uh, and keep within the outlay caps, and uh, to the bias that has been injected into the system in favor of slow spending programs because the outlay caps have been the constraining caps on you for the last three years and uh, to be able to use all the budget authority you have had to shift resources into those programs that have slow spend out rates. On the other side, since the deficit effect of spending is measured by outlays, not by budget authority, caps on budget authority alone might not achieve the discretionary spending reductions that are envisioned in the budget resolution for a particular year. Uh, and so the certainty that uh, outlay caps provide uh, allows a more accurate uh, estimate of where the deficit is going. A third issue that's going to have to be decided is the length of time for which the PAYGO mechanism is extended. If the PAYGO scorecard is extended only for a few years, it becomes easier to push the costs of tax cuts and entitlements expansions off beyond the end of the PAYGO window. And we've seen that uh, already with the expiration of the current PAYGO regime scheduled for 1995. On the other hand, if the PAYGO window is extended for a very long time, say 10 years, the estimates of the impact of proposed legislation on the deficit become increasingly speculative. And uh, I say this with some humility because, of course, my office is responsible for making those estimates, and we're fairly confident we can do this over a five-year window. Uh, we get uh, a lot uh, more queasy when we're asked to tell what a certain policy change enacted today will do to spending in the Medicaid program in the year 2000 or 2001. A reasonable compromise might be to extend the PAYGO discipline for 10 years but to use a five-year rolling scorecard for enforcement. In other words, uh, for this year, the PAYGO scorecard would extend through 1998. Next year, it would extend through 1999, the following year, the year 2000, and so on. Uh, and that would, uh, I think, capture the strengths of both uh, of the options that I discussed. A fourth issue for consideration concerns the base that is to be used for sequestration under the PAYGO system. The current procedure, which has worked fairly well, subjects a rather narrow base of mandatory programs to across-the-board cuts if the PAYGO requirements are not met. A broader base, one that included all mandatory programs and automatic tax increases, might spread the sacrifice more broadly, it might be more credible, and build consensus for real actions to reduce the deficit. A final question involves whether we should establish a trust fund earmarked for deficit reduction. The purpose of such a, a fund would be to provide the public with some form of understandable assurance that the tax increases and spending cuts included in the budget resolution would actually reduce the deficit. Although it's not always apparent to those who do not sleep with their green eye shades on, it is a matter of fiscal fact that any tax increase or spending cut reduces the deficit relative to the levels that would have existed without that action. But saying that deficit reduction has occurred is different from achieving a particular deficit target as we know only too well from our experience with the 1990 Summit Agreement. And th this implies that if uh, we do establish a trust fund as part of this year's reconciliation bill, I think it should be made clear to the American people that it will not 
ensure or guarantee that the deficits projected by the budget resolution will actually come to pass. Let me conclude on a somewhat somber vein by noting that this will not be the last time this subcommittee will have to deal with enforcement issues. While the budget resolution for 1994 represents a major step in the direction of deficit reduction, it does not constitute the whole journey. If it is implemented in full, the deficit should fall from its current level of about $300 billion down to around $190 billion by 1997, but then the deficit is going to rise, and it's going to continue to rise. And what this suggests is that at least one more round of very significant deficit reduction in enforcement will be necessary before we get the deficit to a level that we are comfortable with. That completes my summary, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that the Thank members you so much. What do you think of the administration's uh, budgetary initiatives thus far? Well, I think it's a, a very significant step uh, in the right direction. One can argue over uh, it, does it rely too much on taxes versus uh, discretionary spending cuts? Does it uh, not... Uh, clamp down on entitlements to an appropriate degree, but I regard that as uh, your bailiwick, uh, not mine. Mine is to, to say, uh, is this uh, real beef or is it bun? And it's real beef. It's significant. Uh, it's not uh, as big as the step that was taken in uh, 1990, but one has to remember that uh, this administration and this president will be um, blamed or credited for not only the deficit reduction he is proposing, but also for the deficit reduction that was agreed to in 1990, but the decisions have yet to be made to fulfill. So uh, he is going to uh, have to carry not only his own uh, uh, water, but also some of the water uh, from the 1990 agreement. And uh, if one makes an adjustment for that, uh, the uh, package is comparable to the one uh, that was agreed to in 1990, which seems to be uh, about as much as our political system uh, is capable of bearing every three years. Well, uh, can you help us out with some view of the enforcement mechanisms, since this is an important part of the whole budget process? Well, as I said, I think the uh, system that we have had in place for the last three years has worked uh, surprisingly well. Uh, the Congress has uh, appropriated uh, no more than is allowed under the discretionary spending caps and in many years less uh, than was allowed. And the uh, pay-as-you-go discipline has been adhered to. Uh, we've been left with a deficit that is unacceptable, but it has not been because uh, policymakers reneged on the decisions that were made in 1990. It's because a host of technical factors uh, have driven up the deficit, as have uh, a weak and uh, uh, a weak economy. So you are not optimistic about entitlement caps? Um, well, <laughs> I, I don't think I said that, but, I, but I, um, I do share a good deal of skepticism about entitlement caps as they have been uh, described over the last few years, which tend to be uh, more or less procedural promises. Uh, they are limits of the sort Graham Rudman uh, imposed. Entitlements shall not be higher than X. Uh, and uh, behind that, there is no detailed set of policies to uh, implement if the uh, entitlement programs uh, do threaten these maximum amounts. And uh, so like a balanced budget amendment or various other forms of procedural promises, they look very attractive, but one reason they look so attractive is because uh, nobody has uh, revealed the teeth uh, that would be required to enforce them. I think you also, when you think about entitlement caps, you want to 
realize two things. The first of these is that we basically don't have an entitlement problem. Entitlements are not running amok and have not been running amok in general. Uh, our projections for entitlements over the next 10 years uh, are that the non-health related entitlements will grow more slowly than GDP. Uh, what uh, Social Security will go from 4.9 percent of GDP to 5.0 percent, a tenth of a point increase. Other uh, entitlement programs, non-medical entitlements, will go from 3.9 percent of GDP to 3.1, an actual reduction. Medicare and Medicaid will go from 3.7 to 7.0. That's where the problem is. Uh, but the question is, can you solve that problem by addressing the health care programs of the federal government alone? And I think the experience of the last few years uh, would suggest the answer is no. Uh, the rapid growth in health care costs within the government programs is really a reflection of what's going on in society at large, health care uh, in the private sector is running amok as well. And uh, while we can go in, and we did in the 1980s, go in and ratchet back on these health care programs in the government sector, there's no indication that our success at constraining cost growth in Medicare, for example, had any impact on overall national health expenditures. They actually grew faster in the last half of the 80s than they grew in the first half of the 80s, adjusted for inflation. Uh, what seems to have happened is every penny we saved by screwing down on Medicare uh, was shifted on to the private sector. And so we, as a nation, as a nation of taxpayers, were unwilling to pay the taxes directly necessary to support um, the Medicare program. But indirectly, we did pay that tax, and we paid it by uh, having very rapid increases in our um, private health care premiums that our employer was, was paying or that we were asked to pay. And as a result, our net incomes didn't grow as rapidly as they would otherwise. Thank you very much. Your, your testimony is uh, important and significant to this committee, as always. Mr. McCandless. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Reischauer, we talked in your, you talked in your testimony about the Graham-Rudman Act and the fact that it, that it failed and uh, that it didn't reach its... Let, let me uh, qualify that uh, because okay. I have actually a published article which uh, was... I'm not, I'm not setting landmines out for you to walk through. In praise of Graham-Rudman. Graham-Rudman failed to bring the deficit down as promised. I'm a believer, and I think uh, you probably are too, that uh, having Graham Rudman in place did restrain uh, right. the growth of spending. Okay, well, we didn't meet our goals, and uh, probably there are a number of reasons for it. But then we came along with the 1990 budget uh, agreement, and since that time, our, our budget is as pretty well soared, if I can use that term correctly, and at least that's my assessment of this. Uh, what's what's well, the problem here? Well, the um, 1990 budget agreement and the enforcement procedures required no further deficit reduction action. What those uh, procedures did is it said, you adopt this reconciliation bill and these series of, uh, of uh, cuts, and then the enforcement procedure is going to ensure that there is no backsliding on that. Now, in the Congress's defense, uh, you should remember that at the time these negotiations were going on, my office and the Office of Management and Budget thought that if the 1990 summit agreement was accepted, the deficit would be down below $50 billion by 1995. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, that this was uh, really close to the solution uh, to our problem. We turned out 
uh, to be woefully wrong. Uh, woefully wrong, not because the Congress went and, uh, and uh, uh, abrogated uh, the policy decisions it made, but rather because uh, the economy turned out to be much weaker than we thought, and that has held revenues down and pushed spending for things like unemployment up, uh, and because of um, this nebulous uh, term called the technical factors. And you might say, you know, well, what, what does technical factors mean here? And uh, I'll give you some examples. Uh, when we have good weather in the Midwest and large crops, uh, farm price supports automatically rise because the supply of grains or cotton uh, increases, price falls, price supports go up. That unexpected increases of that sort are counted as technical adjustments. Uh, the Medicare and Medicaid programs have grown far faster than OMB or the Congressional Budget Office projected. Uh, why? Not because the program was enriched or the management of the program changed in any way, uh, but uh, one reason is because there were a number of court cases in the late 80s and uh, early 1990s that uh, said this group of people who have been denied benefits for disability insurance and Medicare and Medicaid uh, uh, have been excluded incorrectly. You have to cover them. Uh, and so uh, the roles uh, rose very, very rapidly. And uh, that's added uh, tens of billions of dollars to the deficit estimates. Uh, another technical factor would be uh, what has happened in the Medicaid program with respect to uh, the craftiness of our state governments. In 1990, we had uh, not really an inkling that state governments would uh, devise uh, provider tax and donation schemes uh, to, in a sense, milk the federal treasury of resources uh, in the Medicaid program. And uh, they have done that extremely skillfully uh, and it has forced up uh, spending. Th these are the kinds of things you have to keep in mind when you ask yourself, uh, could we implement a um, entitlement cap or even a cap on a particular program uh, if we went to the Medicare program and we said, well, um, CBO thought it was going to spend, uh, let's say, a $150 billion in uh, 1994, and instead it's going to spend 170 Why is there the difference? And it turns out that the difference is because the Supreme Court made a decision. Uh, would you then want to respond in some way uh, with an automatic cr across-the-board cut? It, it's very complicated. You might. I mean, I'm not saying that you wouldn't, but I'm not sure you would want to write into law uh, some guillotine approach when there could be many different reasons for this excess spending. Uh, do you want to say when, uh, when the weather is great in the Midwest and uh, uh, we have a bumper wheat crop and wheat prices fall, then we should cut back on the CCC program? I mean, that's what it was intended to, to respond to, precisely. <clears throat> I liken the federal government to uh to an entity that has a certain budget that it establishes irrespective of income and as uh, conditions and uh, the economy change, the budget doesn't change. It continues on in a, a pretty level plane. And so rather than having a balanced budget by doing what is necessary to come within the income, one just goes out and borrows the money. Um, no, I, th I agree with you completely. If you, you say when circumstances change, we should go back and readdress the budget and say, uh, can we afford all these programs that we're providing? Uh, if uh, we can't, should we tax ourselves more heavily? And that should be done. It should be done every year. Uh, it isn't done every year, as you know. Uh, but, you know, I'm not sure that that's... Right. Let me, procedural let me, failing as opposed to... Let me throw you the grenade. Okay. How about zero-based budgeting? Um, 
we've dabbled with this before in the past, back in the Carter administration, I think, as you remember. And um, you can uh, spend a whole lot of time and effort of bureaucrats, uh, in a very wasteful kind of way. Do you really want to go to the to the uh, social security system and debate whether you know we should have one or not? Do you want to uh, debate whether uh, we should have a Securities and Exchange Commission or an Internal Revenue Service or uh, an Immigration and Naturalization Service or a Border Patrol? You know, there are a lot of things uh, that the government does, the courts, the prisons, uh, that basically provide the infrastructure for a complex society and a modern economy. And there's no real sense in going back and rethinking those from scratch. Uh, every year. On the other hand, we clearly have some programs uh, which um, were created in a different era when there were different needs uh, that, uh, that, that should be looked at, reevaluated, and uh, possibly eliminated or greatly reduced. That, and that's, we don't do that. That's the thrust behind the question. Yeah. Once something gets on the books, it very seldom leaves in terms right. of a program and the cost for that program. Old and programs never die. That, uh, yeah. They don't even fade away. <laughs> That's the Very problem. Uh, your assessment of the budget process, we got into that earlier and you were here as a part of the audience. Uh, you heard my comments relative to it. Uh, I've lived in a balanced budget environment for the time that I've been in public office prior to coming to here with some very painful uh, decisions that had to be made relative to law enforcement, fire protection, uh, health, welfare, and the various and sundry other aspects of uh, California county government. Mm -hmm. uh, is there, but there's is one there thing something that the here that, that maybe this committee should look at relative to the budgetary process, realizing it isn't going to solve the economy which produces the revenue that drives the government? But if we can, if we can find something in the way of a process where we don't have to stop and do a Graham Rudman, and then the Graham Rudman maybe steps on some people's toes or it isn't quite what uh, certain parties want, then we go to a budget agreement and the next thing will be a next thing and a next thing and a next thing, which to me indicates that the system is flawed or we wouldn't have to go through a series of events such as we have in the last 8, 10, 12 years. Well, I, I would sh shy away from um, prescriptions that the federal government always run a balanced budget because there's one thing that the federal government does, actually there are two things that the federal government does that uh, the counties and the states and no other unit of government does. One is uh, have responsibility for uh, stabilization of our economy. Uh, and, uh, you know, there is monetary policy to be sure which helps. But uh, we traditionally have resorted to uh, fiscal stimulus when the economy has slowed down. Uh, the other thing, of course, is defense, uh, that uh, the, the um, uh, federal government is responsible for uh, protecting us from foreign enemies. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm skeptical uh, that, uh, that uh, balance is the appropriate prescription for all times. Uh, the real problem here is, I think, not a disagreement on where we should go. I think uh, people on the liberal side of the political spectrum and on the very conservative side of the spectrum all agree that the federal government shouldn't be absorbing as much national saving as it is. It's hurting our economic future. We should get it down, uh, the deficit down. The question is, how do we go about doing it? And uh, is there a substitute for political will? Can process uh, make, uh, create political will where there is none? Uh, I suggest that the Graham Rudman experience uh, proves that uh, that that, uh, that can't work. Uh, process can reinforce the backbone of those with political will once they've made the, de the original decision and then the, uh, they're faced with the onslaught of the groups uh, who are feeling the, the pain. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much, Mr. McCandless. The Chair uh, hopes to entertain the uh, questions and comments Mr. Waxon 
Chairman and Mr. Spratt, and yet make this vote at the same time. Chair recognizes Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Reichardt, I'm going to ask some quick questions, and maybe if you can be very direct in response, we can get through them. Uh, when, when we look at the future and we're trying to hold down the deficit, obviously one way is to restrain spending, and that's what we're talking about, and other ways to raise taxes, and that's a, another issue. Now, if we're going to restrain spending, we have discretionary spending, and we set caps on discretionary spending. The issue is, should we set these kinds of caps on entitlement spending? I was taken aback by the statement you made, and I just want you to repeat it if it's accurate, that the only entitlement area where we're spending more than gross domestic product is in the health care area. Other entitlements are not rising rapidly, that rapidly, uh, higher than inflation. This is our projection for the next 10 years. Correct. So therefore, if people want to want to deal with what they call runaway entitlements, so they're really talking about Medicare and Medicaid. Those that, are the that's correct. two and entitlement if, programs. And if you looked at the, um, uh, Director Darman's um, entitlement cap proposal, which projected that there would be $316 billion of excess entitlement spending over the next five years above his limits, you found that $289 billion, or 91 percent of the total, was to be found in the Medicare and Medicaid programs. If we simply press down on what we spend on, on government programs like Medicare and Medicaid, will that mean those costs will be shifted over to the private the sector? states and local well, governments? We have two possibilities here. Uh, there are three to be to, to uh, give uh, Mr. Kasich uh, his, his due, and he, I think he had a good point. It is conceivable, and one would hope, that we can make the government programs more efficient and save some money. But my guess is the scope for saving there is relatively modest. Uh, the uh, second possibility is that we ratchet down on Medicare or Medicaid provider reimbursements, which already are below the cost of providing those services, and the providers of these services, the hospitals, the doctors, uh, to compensate themselves for this lost income, just ratchet up the amounts they charge uh, the rest of us, uh, and the care stays the same. The third possibility, of course, is faced with uh, reduced uh, payment levels, the quality of care received by Medicaid and Medicare uh, recipients diverges significantly from the quality of care that the rest of us receive. And uh, that would show up in uh, one form, which would be the number of doctors who decide they will treat Medicaid and Medicare patients, uh, number one, or uh, the, uh, the quality of those doctors relative to the other doctors. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't want any of those uh, results. We would certainly want more efficiency in whatever savings you can get. We, we don't want to deteriorate the quality. We don't want to shift to the private sector. That's why President Clinton has talked about health reform, not just on the government side, but overall. But some people might say, well, that sounds all well and, and fine, but what if we don't get national health reform and we still have Medicare and Medicaid programs? Why not just build in a projected increase, which is far above the inflation rate? It'll be the medical economic index. And, uh, and uh, we'll look at, at the best judgment we can as to what those increases m ought to be. And then we'll say, you can't have any more increases above that. Wouldn't, would, would that work, or are we then faced with the fact that we've locked ourselves in a box because we really can't control lots of things like what the economy is doing, what the inflation rate may be, how much of an unemployment increase there might be, uh, which will mean more people uh, getting on the Medicaid uh, rolls. Uh, same thing would be if poverty rates uh, are in poverty, uh, those un under poverty would be increasing. Uh, while we have projections on what health care costs might be, our, project, our ability to project is, has not always been all that accurate, so we may well not be able to predict that. Uh, we may not know about an AIDS epidemic or something like it uh, that is unforeseen. You indicated in the Medicaid program we didn't anticipate the states came up with this whole way of getting more federal dollars uh, than anybody ever expected them to through a use of uh, provider taxes, disproportionate share. So aren't we then facing a, uh, even our best projections likely or could, could well be off, uh, off what the reality will be? Um, 
I've been humbled over the last four years, and I can assure you that uh, our best projections, which I would argue are the best available, uh, will be wrong uh, for 1998 uh, by a significant amount. Things that we cannot foresee now uh, will have uh, significant impacts on Medicare and Medicaid costs. Could be in either direction. Unfortunately, recent history uh, seems to suggest that uh, the uh, the errors are always in the same direction of underestimating. Would your best guidance be to us, reform the health care system overall if you want to bring in cost controls uh, that are predictable, cost increases that are predictable? Well, as say. you know, uh, my office doesn't make recommendations, but I think it would be a, uh, a reasonable inference uh, that uh, when I said uh, I didn't think that the health care problem the, the cost problem in the government programs can be solved within the government sector alone. That, Secondly, uh, would you then reach the conclusion that perhaps we better come back each year and see what's happening in the real world and then make changes that are appropriate? Uh, yes, I think that is a, a sensible way to go. But the problem here is one I think that Mr. Spratt uh, raised, and that is once uh, we decide on a very painful uh, set of deficit reduction measures as we did in 1990 and as we are going to do in 1993, um, we're very reluctant to come back the next year or the year after and readdress these issues, Since you've raised uh, but the we issue, should. Since you've raised the issue that Mr. Spratt had raised, I'm going to yield my time to him because we have very little time left and maybe he wants to I, th I thank the gentleman for yielding. A uh, couple of quick points. Could, could you have CBO provide us with a chart? that takes the budget resolution we adopted this year from FY93 through FY98 and shows entitlements year by year in the aggregate and then breaks out the major individual entitlements over the same period of time. I hope that's just a paste up from something you've already um, got. It, it really isn't uh, for the simple reason that um, the budget resolution includes reconciliation instructions to committees, and they can c fulfill those committee th those reconciliation instructions any way they want. And the way they decide, the way Mr. Waxman yeah, decides to, to uh, split between um, Medicaid and Medicare Part B savings will affect yeah. uh, what the numbers look like in 1998. And so it's, it's not easy to get, it's impossible basically to get that breakdown. At this point in the process. At this point in the process. Once the reconciliation bill is approved, it is possible. Okay, okay. Uh, can you give us the aggregate for entitlements? Yeah, uh, we can give you that the, the, of time. the basic uh, picture to the extent that it's definable at this point. I, I mentioned earlier the possibility of having some kind of extension of the PAYGO rule that would be coupled with uh, a mandatory reconciliation process so that uh, we would take the projection of aggregate entitlements and maybe individual entitlements as well and provide that to the extent they exceeded their projected uh, allowance in this year's budget resolution by a certain amount, maybe 10 percent, maybe some band of uh, variability. then we would have to do one of two things in reconciliation. We would have to confront the issue at least, and we would have to either provide the revenues to pay for the uh, additional cost, or we would have to cut cost and bring the uh, deficit impact uh, down to neutral. Do you see that as a workable scheme? Uh, yes, I do. I mean, I think it, um, uh, it, it uh, forces a reevaluation of the situation if the entitlement outlook deteriorates. The one problem that I would have with this is it would suggest that if somehow entitlements stay within this uh, cap, we don't have to address any deficit issues. And uh, as I said before, uh, the President's proposal and what is going through the Congress right now is an important step in the right direction, but we've got a long way to go after it, uh, even if entitlements remain well behaved over the next five years. So I would hope that there is some way through the budget process that uh, we readdress the deficit every year. But assuming revenues obtained, they reasonably tracked the projections 
your projections mm -hmm. over the next five fiscal years. If we kept entitlements in the aggregate within those limits, if we did what we've done over the last three years and hewed to the discretionary spending limits, then the deficits we projected would we'll also come to pass. Pay. We'll have deficit a little below two hundred billion dollars yeah. in nineteen ninety seven. And this would be a way of saying with some credibility that uh, leaving revenues is the only variable. And we can't uh, that's a big, guarantee that's them. a big uh, variable. Yeah, it is a big variable. You put a chart in here, table one, that everybody should read because it shows that the variance in revenues alone since FY90 is $540 billion, which was more than we set out to uh, reduce the deficit mm -hmm. by. This shortfall in revenues more than exceeded the deficit reduction total that was actually affected. It would be a trillion dollars. We'd be a trillion dollars worse in debt uh, had we not carried out the uh, budget summit agreement of FY90. That's correct. But the shortfall in revenues. The other aspect, though, as you pointed out here, was that uh, Medicaid and Me Medicare in particular have grown substantially. In a three-year period of time, you have revised your estimate for that five-year period from 91 through 95 by $189 billion, which is just a phenomenal uh, increase over a short period of time. I've got a minute and 39 seconds to go vote. Thank you very much for your testimony. If you have some ideas... I, I have two minutes to get across town to give a speech. <laughs> <laughs> if you have any ideas that you'd be willing to share about how we could cap entitlements or about how we might extend the PAYGO rule, we would welcome having them submitted them for record. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Uh, the hearing is here by adjourned. John, thanks. You better run. Well, it is Comments about this hearing on the possibility of extending the Budget Enforcement Act of 1990 should be sent to the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Legislation, B373, Rayburn Office Building, Washington, D.C. The zip code is 20515.